e sozinho. That's not on. Okay, we're going to start the uh, Issaquah City Council Land and Shore Committee Thursday, July 6th, and we have several items on our agenda. Uh, what I will say in terms of uh, public comment is that on uh, agenda items B, C, and D, and E, uh, we will take public comment um, after each of those, brief co public comment after each of those. Um, so I will announce that after we're done with our questions. And um, also, I'll introduce ourselves. I'm Stacy Goodman, and to my left is Mary Lou Polly, and to my right is Paul Winterstein. And up at the podium is Keith Niven, uh, Director of Development Services Department and Economic Development. And the first item on our agenda is moratorium update. Um, thank you. So um, the six moratorium work items, um, we're moving them all forward. There's uh, the there's none on tonight. I actually thought there. Oh, there is amending parking. Um, so later on in the agenda, we'll deal with parking, which is coming back from PPC. Um, and uh, the others are kind of trekking along. Um, so the next check-in point for the council is going to be August is that the 7th, whatever the council meeting is in August. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm planning to do for you all is to give you um, a memo that will talk about the progress made on each of the work items and what's left to do, including whatever touch points there may be. Um, Monday um, of this month is um, District Visions. So that'll be your first opportunity to have a conversation with staff about um, where we are in the process and what we've learned about the neighborhoods uh, that comprise Central Issaquah. Um, and I think at the end of this month at the COW is affordable housing. So, so you'll get that, um, the tools that we've identified for affordable housing and there'll be a conversation about that and our approach that we've come up with working through a joint commission with Planning Policy Commission, Human Services Commission and Economic Vitality Commission. Oh, and you guys are also going to get the big presentation from our consultant on architecture and urban design. Uh, we've got a draft manual. We're going through that with DC this month. So two DC meetings um, to kind of work through the nuts and bolts. Three DC meetings. So three DC meetings. Um, you can tell I'm a little bit, um, I am a little bit detached. Um, and then uh, you guys get kind of the big presentation at the end of the month. So that's that's our stuff. So you mentioned August 7th. It says on the calendar, uh, pu council public hearing on moratorium. Um, that's to what consider? So at that point, that's your decision point to either lift, extend, or something in between. So I thought that at another count, recent council meeting, we talked about when the moratorium actually expired, and wasn't that early October? So the six months will be September, but we have to have the hearing before, and because we cancel the second meeting in August, typically, um, I'm assuming that's happening this year, it has to be the first meeting in August. So it's just, it's the last touch point that we have with you guys before a September point. Was that when it expires in early September? Yeah. I thought. Okay. Okay. Um, so, with that in mind, um, it looks like the calendar has the following um, a schedule for adopt for the council to consider adopting the different elements. Um, architectural fit and urban design is October 16th, as is vertical mixed use. Affordable housing is September 18th. Parking is July 17th. District Visions, November 20th. Um, and so, do you know what the talk is about what's coming forward in early, uh, 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 the recommendation? Do you know what that is yet, or is that preliminary? We should no. Just say no if it's no. I don't know what the recommendation okay. is from the administration yet. Okay. I, I, I would guess that the mayor would like for you to lift the moratorium um, in August. I'm not sure that 
we can get you there, but we'll we'll have a conversation about that. Okay. Okay. Other questions about the moratorium calendar? Okay, the next item on the agenda is Agenda Bill 7452, Transit Oriented Development. Um, a memorandum, the TO, sorry, Transit Oriented, Oriented Development Memorandums of Understanding. That was referred yes. tonight. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you probably just heard about this, so. Hi, um, my name is Jen Davis Hayes, work in economic development. I'm the project manager for the Transit Oriented Development. Uh, we are here tonight to talk about um, the two MOUs that are non-binding, but very important for us to move on next steps um, with this project, as you probably remember. Um, so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the project, give you a reminder of the components, and talk about the progress we've made to date and the upcoming timeline, where, when the decision points are for Council and then uh, get into more details about the MOUs and then our next steps. And we have our development partners here from King County Housing Authority and Spectrum Development Solutions, which will be joining me at the mic as well. So, any questions? Okay, so just as a reminder, our uh, transit-oriented development project site is uh, here in Orange. Um, it's next to the transit center, which is the white, and across the street from Tibbetts Valley Park. Currently, CenturyLink business as operation site is located here and working with them to relocate to the King County Roads property site, which we purchased. <laughs> Putting new locks on next week, so uh, the city uh, is in full possession at this time. Um, and we will be talking about the annexation part of that in the annexation uh, uh, presentation later today. So again, a reminder of the components of the transit oriented development, and part of these were um, uh, suggested or required in the, R the request for proposals that we put out. So um, the, it's a vertical mixed use building, which is an, um, a great thing to see that as far as the, the building type. We're looking at both affordable and market rate housing, and um, if you've been looking at past presentations, the number of affordable units has actually gone up. And so again, that's as when you create a concept and then you kind of work through the details, you're able to find ways to provide more and adjust things. And so um, uh, King County Housing Authority can, can talk a little more about that during their presentation. Um, there will be ground floor commercial space. So some of that will be um, private and some uh, will be publicly owned, we, we anticipate. And then the c connection to the area amenities. So again, looking that it's an, across the street from the park, uh, we have, we have, they'll have a, pl a plaza on that side on Newport, and then also a mid-block crossing that connects directly into where the sidewalk is for the transit center. So as the multiple blocks, as we look here, um, you can see that blue dotted line, those multiple blocks um, um, develop over time. They'll have that mid-block all the way through. Um, that blue line there next to the project site is what uh, is defined in the Central Issaquah Plan. Um, for a core street, and so the de this development will build um, a little more than half the, s the site, uh, the street, and so again, that will help to create that grid system that we want to see to break up the blocks in the central Issaquah. Any questions? Okay. So in general, um, and again, this is a high, le high level, this is subject to change, and we, you know, of course, we'll want to get things um, open as quickly as possible, but we're looking at tonight, again, reviewing the MOUs, getting any feedback and coming back in August to finalize and hopefully get a recommendation to adopt those at August 7th um, full council meeting. Um, in September, and that's one of the reasons we need to have that in order to, uh, for King County Housing Authority is actually the applicant to the King County TOD fund. And so that happens in September. By December, we'll know of that $10 million allocation, how much is allocated to this project. Um, and then in the fall of this year and continuing to 2018, um, our development team will be working on the design and permitting. And, and during that time, we'll uh, be t touching base again with council um, to talk about more of the details. Again, so tonight's MOUs are non-binding, so it doesn't commit to anything, where, but it has an intention to go forward and do that. So during that, that timing, that process of the design and permitting um, will we'll, uh, come forward with an agreement that we'll, we'll come to. Is, I'm not sure if it'll be a development agreement or just an uh, agreement um, that uh, outlines all the details of the project and make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, so the other funding, you know, securing other funding and doing community outreach, outreach will also happen in 2018. And this site um, is, you know, different than just 
uh, moving forward on building affordable housing, they actually have to build the other site for the relocation and then demolish and, and start. So the reality is that the TOD, the, the residential component and the uh, mixed use component will be open anticipating in 2021. So it sounds like far away, but it's actually not too bad. <laughs> Any questions in general timeline? And then I talk, and I, this slide talks about, so where are the decision points for the city? So, um, so uh, we actually already finalized purchase, and thank you for the King County Roads property. Um, we uh, did talk to the Finance Committee um, in May, and we're gonna come back to full council talk um, uh, in the fall to talk about the multifamily tax exemption. And at that time, we'll have a full analysis of what that means, um, and, uh, and it's, we are suggesting for, for this to be a pilot site to adopt it, so we're not looking at a larger uh, scope. So here we are tonight at Land and Shore. Again, want the finalization for uh, the MOUs on August 7th, and, and et cetera. So the, uh, the decision points are then starred there. So annexation will be a decision point for you. And I believe it's September. And, um, and then if, if they are successful in, in getting funding from ARCH, the council approves that during the normal process of that ARCH funding in 2018. So, okay. Thoughts, questions so far? Okay. Okay. And so Hal Ferris from um, Spectrum Development Solutions will come up and talk about the MOUs. So can, how do we go back just, to the schedule? Okay. Yeah. Um, so just to, uh, hello again, and it's good to see you all. Um, do you mind moving Jacob over oh. to my side? It's good to see you. I know you get it recorded that way. Um, <laughs> most people can hear me, so that's not a problem. Um, I wanted to just reemphasize the schedule. This, we, this King County, uh, who has the TOD funds, they have um, set us, set up a schedule to um, make the funds available for different set-aside areas. Uh, Isqua is a set-aside area, Bell Red Corridor is a set-aside, the Northgate area is a set-aside, there's a set-aside for the Des Moines area, and then one around the Pac Med Hospital. And King County realized that if they put all of those set-asides out on the market at once, they didn't have enough bond cap, 4% tax credits to be able to support all those projects. So they had to go back in and look at their schedule and stretch them out. And Jen and I went to a meeting uh, where they were looking at doing that, and we said, well, we will have, Isqua will have land control for this site uh, in July, we said, and so we will be ready for your application. So they said, let's go with Isqua, let's put them first on the docket. So, mm -hmm. so that's, that's why there's a push. No, it's always, was always the plan, and we were lucky that it just didn't get delayed as some of the other set-asides did. And so what's, what's real important is for us to the RFP is supposed to come out this month, probably next week, and it has to be submitted on September 13th. And we, to submit for that, and that we as the collective we here, uh, we have to have land control. So your annexation, which is supposed to be finalized on September 6th, is really important because it's hard to have land control when it's not even part of ISQA yet. Um, and second, these the MOUs, which will which I will talk about now, we originally were gonna have just one tri-party agreement with CenturyLink, the housing authority, ourselves, and the city. But we realized there was a whole bunch of, of parts of the agreement that CenturyLink really didn't have to get involved in. They don't really care how many affordable units we're gonna put on their site, or what are the amenities gonna be, or whether we're building a core street. So we separated them into just two agreements, one that just dealt with the things that were specific to CenturyLink, and the other ones which were of greater interest to the city of what we were going to develop on the TOD site itself. So that's why there's two agreements, so that we didn't have to drag CenturyLink through all the other pieces. Um, so this first agreement, um, which is the MOU um, between, which is MOU, there's two, two agreements, which I just spoke of. One is with CenturyLink, it's focused on the relocation site. So as a reminder, um, you're annexing this uh, piece of property um, that you're going to talk about later today. Um, but out of that, there's a small piece, three acres out of the 20 some acres that you're annexing that will be used to relocate CenturyLink to that location. So we, as the developer, need to build them their new facility. And so we have to reach an agreement with them that they will agree to both what we're going to build and the timing of when that's going to get done. And on top of which, CenturyLink wants to make sure that they're getting 
uh, full value of their property. They, they entered into this with the city and said, hey, we were supportive of the city's goals, but that didn't mean that they were willing to donate some, leave some value on the table. They want to get full value. So we are in the process. So part of that whole thing, which it says in that MOU, in the MOU is we need to get an appraisal done on their existing site, the TOD site, so that they know what the value of their property is that they're going to be leaving. And then we would get an appraisal done on their new location after, you know, assuming that we built a new building on it. So the appraisal will look at our drawings and say it's going to be about a 30,000 square foot building. It meets all these criteria. And then there'll be two values. And they want to make sure that if the value of their land is worth more than what they're getting, then we would pay them the difference. The developer would pay them the difference. So the city isn't, you know, isn't involved in that, but they need to, they need to make sure they're getting um, equal dollars. There was no contribution intended on their part. Um, and the city's involved because they, the city owns the land and we, Spectrum, actually buy the land from the city or take possession of from the city before we can build a new facility. We can't build a new facility on land somebody else owns. You know, so we have to take possession of it from title, um, build a new building on it, and then we would give the completed facility to CenturyLink um, after it's all done. And they approve our drawings and all those. So that's what the first MOU is all about. Can I add something real quick? Um, so one of the things, again, um, uh, timing-wise, is in a ladder to keep onto that schedule of 2021, even though it seems far away, you know, many steps along the way, is that uh, Spectrum needs to do some environmental assessment on the property. And CenturyLink isn't comfortable of coming, having them come in and dig holes until they have an MOU in place, right? right? So so that's also an important piece of the timing so they can, in the fall, start to do that and not are not delayed further, right. so. The CenturyLink has given us the approval. We're, what we're doing right now is a survey and the level one environmental, but they won't let us do the destructive drill holes or take samples until this MOU is complete. Mm -hmm. So if we get the MOU signed in August by the city then and CenturyLink, then we can do that work before the application goes in on September 13th. So there's again a tightness of the time frame that has to come together because we the the application that's due on September 13th requires that we have geotechnical information and environmental information as part of that application that's due on September 13th. So there isn't any kind of wiggle room in that time frame. Um, then the second agreement is the uh, the MOU that's between the city. Spectrum and the King County Housing Authority. It's focused on the TOD site, what's being developed there, how many affordable units, the length of affordability, the street improvements, building the core street, the mid-block crossing, um, the other the other amenities that goes that goes into that and how that all comes together. So that's kind of detailed in that. Um, and then just the overview again for again to allow them to apply for the King County TOD fund to show that they're that we are committed to providing them the site. So uh, that shows site control as opposed to them having to purchase it first. So, so we took both of the two MOUs and um, we the one sections are highlighted in red are the ones that we thought you guys would want to put your most attention on. And the first one is the city's acquisition of the county property, which the staff has briefed you on. You'll hear a little more about that today. Um, it's pretty getting pretty well completed at that point. And then our act, Spectrum's acquisition of the replacement site, you know, and that you you don't want to have us purchase that until we've made a commitment of what we're going to build on the TOD site. Uh, and, and that's what the second MOU does. So the second MOU actually pulls the first MOU in as a condition, but we just did it that way so that CenturyLink wouldn't have to get caught up in those pieces. Um, the rest of them are a lot of uh, more formal communications, exclusivity, we do have an exclusivity agreement because we didn't want to do all this work and then have CenturyLink sell you know, the site to somebody else comes in and you know, offers them 10% more just out of the blue. So once they sign this, then they're locked into working with us all the way through the TOD grant process. They can't you know, pull the rug out from underneath us at the last minute. And, and so you do have a copy of both MOUs. So, and if you have questions about those other sections, we're more than willing to talk about that. But again, we just thought these might be the ones that you, that are most impactful to the city and the decisions you'll be making. So, so I did read them, and okay. they're largely the same. Um, I have a question about um, section number nine, 
um, and as you've mentioned, the agreements are non-binding except for Section 6 and 7 above. Section 6 is investigation of the project site, right. which I understand, but number 7 is communications, and one of them uh, in the communications section um, requires coordination on communication about the project, and it obligates the city, all the parties, um, including the city, um, to um, accurately describe in public statements um, the, uh, the TOD project, its various component, components, um, and present to the public um, in a consistent, thoughtful, and positive manner. Um, so I don't have any issue with that with regard to the um, city big C, um, but I j uh, just wanted to, somebody to at some point, maybe before this comes before the council, to address whether um, the city council would be caught within that as well. No, I would think no, but I think that's, I've not, Typically, I've not when our agreements say city, capital C, mm -hmm. that include that's you guys. Um, and, and typically when we are, if we're talking about the administration, it would be clear that it's either the administration or the city administration. But what Ogden Murphy Wallace has said in the past is if it says city, big C, that's, that's you guys. It says the city of Issaquah. That's you guys. So um, I would like to, for somebody to address that because um, that needs to be, I mean, if, that, if the city council is um, bound by this communication provision, then I think that needs to be highlighted. Your preference, just to be clear, would be that's the city administration is fine um, and maybe more appropriate given that we, communications typically come out from the administration. Okay. When I read it, that right. popped out. Okay. I would agree with Keith. When I read this, and, and I and I do interpret the capital C as being the city, but just like you said, the administration has a communications discipline yes. and staff, um, and it's not too common that council, whether it be leadership or anybody, is okay. We're going to do press release. Let's sit down and talk about that language. I just didn't, I, so I, I, I say that because I assumed that this was the administration and their communications. But we can, we can clarify. Yeah, Thank and you. that's all I'm asking. Yep. I mean, we can all sit around and talk about how we read it, which doesn't really mean much. We need somebody to tell us what that intent is sure. so that we are clear. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. No comment on that. I have a different comment. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay. So, um, as far as the documents go and the content and the schedule, I don't have any particularly detailed comments about that except the schedule is hugely tight and requires us to do things in this really fast manner. Um, but the documents themselves seem like you're asking us to move through some administrative processes so that we keep on track so we get things done. I'm fine with all of that. My bigger concern is that it's a complex project. It's different from all the other kinds of projects as far as I know that we've tried to do um, that give us affordable housing and you're going to be coming to a council of seven. You guys are a great tag team, by the way. Mm -hmm. You really seem to get this and you understand it. We do not. We have not looked at our housing strategy and we have never actually comprehensively as a council even discussed what our strategy ought to be towards housing. Um, if you want to make sure this moves through with one touch, you're going to have to give us some sort of primer in here about why this project is different. I heard this project compared a week ago to the TDR request by Polygon, which is entirely different type of project and that this was just the same kind of thing and that's from a council person. So we don't know exactly what you have on the table. Um, so we need that information so that we all see that what kind of project this is and how does it compare and I have some ideas I can share with you, Jen, on what that Good. information might okay. look like Good. because we need to be educated on this. Otherwise, you're going to have people getting stuck, and it's going to be hard for us to make all of your deadlines, Great, and that, thank would, you. that, that would be a tragedy. So just FYI, I, we did offer uh, other council members briefings before August 7th, understanding that for them it's one touch, for you it's two, but um, so... Um, and I'm thinking more than briefings, I'm actually thinking I'd like to talk to you about what I think might be some suggested content you might want Perfect. to include to get us all in Perfect. the same place, to get us all understanding Great. what we see here and how is it different from what we've seen before. But not having seen the draft housing strategy yet, 
how does this Second. tie in in that terms was, of meeting the mark? Good. So th that was my next point. And so I'm actually working with Trish on the, the housing strategy. And so this is actually one of the six points of that addresses affordable housing. And so you guys are, again, come, it's the end of July then um, that they'll be here. So um, it's a discrete uh, project. And again, it talks about this as a pilot um, for MFTE, but it talks about the TO, the transit oriented development project. So there'll be more discussion around the, that project in that, in that context as well. That's great. It's, and the, I think but one of six, I think the preliminary descriptions we got of the project were good, but I don't think the council has a full understanding of what this project is. And so coming with the tight timeline and mm -hmm. this has to move on this date and not having had the housing strategy, I feel like we might be at a bit of a disadvantage. Okay. And so okay. I can provide you some extra Perfect. comments by email. Thank you. We do have, and I'll Dan come up and talk about the housing authority. The We do have, um, what's unusual on this is this requirement to just to be able to submit for the funding from King County. And part of, we don't go into the full details of all the nuts and bolts because if, if we were to get three million dollars instead of the ten million dollars the project probably isn't going anywhere and so we can't fully design this thing and put it all together without really knowing what the funding support from the county will be so that's why we're doing this mou so it's and that's why it's non-binding why it's really a policy document that says this is how we're going to work together mm -hmm. and then once that application goes in we can then start to develop the more we will we're already um, as a requirement of the pra of the um, application we have to get the site appraised so we will know more information by the time we submit the site will that'll start to show more of the cards on how it all lays out and then we can work on the detail and, and the staff can work to bring the rest of the council along on you know what is the city really con contributing in all the different ways in which they contribute to make the project work so this is really approving a policy document, knowing that you get to see the nuts and bolts of it later. But and I, I don't even think I want to go right to the nuts and bolts. It's right. more about making sure that all of our that our council has a good understanding of the basic form of the project, so we don't get hung up on what the project is, and that we do move right. and follow this time right. schedule. Okay. Okay. I would just, so, if I may, make a comment. I think the MOUs do a really good job of laying out the basics of this. It, we understand the, the, uh, the land that's involved, the who and their roles, what we're agreeing with one another or in between parties, even though it's interesting, there are three-way MOUs and yet there's very, there are sections in there that just include two parties. Right. And, but um, but I, I, did, I did find that reading them, um, I think does give a very good picture of the moving parts. So I just, okay. that, that's a kudos. I do have, I will have when we, at the appropriate time, um, some very specific questions about some of the language. So okay. I want to continue with uh, you, what your plan was and we'll make time for that. Okay. Yeah. The, we were going to move to the, the next agreement, which is the agreement between the city, Spectrum, and King County Housing Authority. And we've highlighted those sections and I'll let Dan talk a little bit about that agreement and how it ties in the affordable units and how those are intermixed as well. I'm Dan Watson. I'm the Deputy Director for the King County Housing Authority. We're excited to be a part of this project. But um, what's important to understand is that there is the affordable component of this is obviously part of the vision that was originally given to us, but it's also critical in terms of attracting the funding from the county. And we've also put in other levels of subsidy. And I think that gets at the question about your ultimate strategy, why this is different than other projects, because it's, it's the targeting, it's the interplay between the levels of affordability and the funding. And so we are really targeting a workforce population at what is called, you know, 60% of the area median income. And that's also attractive to getting the funding from the county. We were the recipient of three other fund funding grants last year out of this particular TOD fund. So that's one thing that made it particularly attractive to us to work on this project in Issaquah because it was well positioned to take advantage of the funding that's being provided through the county. So what we're looking at, we originally envisioned 125 affordable units. But some of the feedback we got was that, well, let's look at that per unit subsidy. If you divide that into $10 million, and they thought, well, the county, sort of the informal feedback was, seems a little high. So we think we can actually make it a little more efficient use of the site and the podium deck by maybe 
bumping that up to 155 units, slightly smaller units, maybe a little bed, different bedroom mix, but that'll get our per unit subsidy down and position us better. But the, cre the critical elements is gaining site control before September 13th, getting our whole application together with all the various appraisals and environmental work, and that's absolutely crucial to, to getting the $10 million, which is crucial to making this project work. So it all kind of interplays amongst itself, and certainly we can get into a lot more detail as to how that's all going to lay out. But this MOU doesn't get into those specifics, but talks about just the fact that this is affordable and market rate housing in one project with lots of other public amenities and infrastructure. One, we've been working, trying to make our application more competitive, um, and this is the application for the King County funds, and we realized our cost per unit was too high for the, when we allocated everything out. So we increased, we looked at our building efficiency, the podium, uh, maximizing the uh, use of the podium so we can really take what were sunk costs or fixed costs, like building the roads doesn't change based on how many units we're building, putting the mid-block crossing doesn't change, even building the podium itself doesn't change. If we can get more units on that same podium, we are able to spread those costs over more units. When we were last with here giving you the general overview, on the spectrum side, we had 20% of our units were affordable between 70 and 80% of area median income. And, but just for the 12-year period of the tax exemption that was going to go with it. And that, that wasn't, wasn't playing out as well as we would have liked. So we went back and looked at our numbers and said, if we can make 10% of our units affordable, permanently affordable, that adds 20 units on top of what the housing authority is doing, and that gets us up into that 180 affordable units and, and really starts bringing that cost down per unit. So we have that mix. We always had a mix of affordable units and market rate on the spectrum side, but now we've been able to look at those and, and um, reduce the number, but make them permanently affordable uh, to help really make it a, a long-term affordable project. So that's how the application will be presented and put forth uh, going into it. And I think, you know, this is probably well beyond anything in your housing strategy in one site. It's largely gained by both the housing authorities' significant participation uh, in the project, a lot of their own money, their own uh, loan that's going into this. This is not just your regular not-for-profit coming in and partnering on this. They are putting a substantial amount of their own resources into this, but also the set-aside, which is making it happen. So anyway, it's a... Well, I might add, too, the one thing we are going... You normally do is we will put in an additional <coughs> layer of rental subsidies on a small number of units, some between 20 and 40 units that will serve very low income families primarily. It's part of an overall strategy to get more lower income families in areas of high opportunity such as Issaquah that have jobs, services, and good schools. So that's, that's something we will do with our own resources. So the, the <clears throat> um, Jen kind of skipped ahead here, but the, um, the MOU between the city, the Housing Authority, and Spectrum the items we highlighted are first the replacement site agreement. That was the first MOU we just talked about. Um, those are the ones. Uh, then we have the project site agreement itself, where we have the description, the open space, community space, the sensitive areas and buffers around the site, residential units and density and the affordability that we just talked about, the commercial unit uses on the ground floor. We still have a continued uh, strong interest from the uh, Bright Horizons Daycare and the Northwest Kidney Center that want to go into the f into this facility. And some people aren't as enthused about the Kidney Center, and they remind us that one in six Americans will have kidney disease in their life. So it's a significant advantage for ISQA to have that kind of resource here to serve your constituents. Um, uh, we have the site design standards, which we'll get into your design criteria. Uh, parking requirements, um, which we're right now meeting your code all of our parking is structured parking on this site so it's beyond what you're talking about later today it does we are a little bit concerned about this parking requirement as it applies to the century link replacement site which is in your urban core and making sure that the parking we're building there counts as structured parking because uh, if we have to build their service facility on top of parking or something it would no, not work not urban core but uh, right area. right yeah so as you talk about that. And you also have to decide if what you're setting about parking as well. So right. right. So council still has yet to decide whether or not the 
CenturyLink site will be, and so this parking concern has not yet been. Right, okay. I was just reading ahead in your agenda and I was like, <laughs> you know. Um, the infrastructure requirements are spelled out, what will ultimately be spelled out in terms of what we're having to do. That's one of the big challenges because as, as you develop the Issaquah itself, you don't have the infrastructure, roads, sewers, all those kind of things aren't in place. So that makes the cost high. And then our schedule, which we've talked about. The multifamily tax exemption, which uh, Jen says will have come up later to the council, but that'll be an important part for this project to make it work, um, to, to be able to adopt that, even if it's a pilot project for this project. Um, and I think she's gonna get into that later with the council, not today, but another time. And then the impact fees, most of those are called out in your current regulations already. The impact fees that are waived um, as a result for those that apply to the affordable units. The market rate units still have to pay the impact fees, but the affordable units are in your current regulations. Many of them you do not. And then we do know that the core, the street improvements we make to the core street, those can offset the traffic impact fees that otherwise would be paid because that's one of your uh, identified capital projects. And that, when you, it'll be important for the city to identify, and we can help you do that is, is what is the city really contributing with the waiver of all those impact fees because as part of this application going in for the county, we have to show they want to see that the city is contributing as well, that this isn't happening just by the, the housing authority's participation and the county's participation. And so waiving of impact fees is not consistent of all around our east side cities. Redmond doesn't waive impact fees, so the fact that Issaquah does can show as a essentially a, a contribution being made by the city. Is that Issaquah's um, financial contribution is the waiving of the in this and MFT? And the provision of property. The land, the, the site we're getting. And MFT. Mm -hmm. Right, and the MFT, the MFT, all those would count. Okay. And But again, um, he mentioned we're, we're doing that analysis and we'll provide again that information so you're aware of that. But that's something that's are, for the impact fees uh, is already uh, in the code. So we're not asking for anything different. No, new. right. So we would get a, a cost per unit which is made up of whatever the MFTE contribution is, whatever the impact fee waivers is, the land that's donated or cash that the city puts in. We would know yeah. what the city has contributed per unit. Perfect. Do that. Okay, I think that's all the overview we're having, and then if there are specific questions that we can answer. Question or comment? Question. Okay. So um, I know it's ahead on the agenda, but how significant of an, of an impact to the project requirements is it whether or not the parcel, the new CenturyLink parcel, is in or out of the central Issaquah area in terms of impacts to? either the cost of the project, whatever. We, um, I went through your, the intense uh, commercial zoning and the standards, the design standards that apply to that, looking to see if there's things in there that really don't fit given its location. I mean, it's, it's up there, you know, behind your maintenance, the city's maintenance facility, behind the trailer park, you know, those kind of things. Um, in as a whole, they weren't. I I was expecting to he, see a lot more um, requirements that really weren't applicable, and I was it wasn't it wasn't that extensive. Um, we're still allowed to have chain link fence is still allowed within intense commercial. You can put barbed wire on top of it. Not that we are intending on doing that, or I don't think. I mean, Century Link. I don't think they have that now, so I don't see why they would want that. It does require landscape screening if you have a chain link fence. So there, we might say, you know. Yeah, that's applicable for the frontage that faces when you come up to it, but when you get back in the woods there, you know, is that, is that, a, um, that important? So we had a provision in the MOU that we would go through and look at those and identify those kind of things that maybe aren't applicable to come back and ask for exceptions to some of those standards, not having identified every one. We are, uh, we are concerned as you were, if you were to adopt this into central Issaquah and then add a structured parking requirement. And we don't, we, CenturyLink wants to have the parking we're providing for them covered and secured. I mean, walls all around or the roof over it, like a service facility like they have now. And we don't think, we think that would 
um, meet the definition of structured parking as compared to a carport, but that would be important to us um, because we this would make so sense to build a service facility and have it look like an urban project worth you know underground parking or anything like that. Thanks. I mean they have five or seven thousand square feet. It's like locker rooms for their crew, you know, and little teeny five hundred square foot office, and all the rest of it is for parking their service vehicles. That's what the building's about. So. So those are, we don't know what, well, I guess what our concern is, is what new provisions might be added that we're not aware of that would be applied to this that we don't know what that, those might be. Yeah, well, I guess we will be talking about parking, but the, later on, and I think even what's listed in there, the idea that such a yard would be classified as office because the parking that we're considering is only regarding office and residential, at least as currently yeah. presented. So it doesn't right. strike me as office. Yeah. We'll get to that. You know, the, the second uh, MOU, uh, so, so I'm going to go down to some of the language. I sure. just want to make sure I understand. Sure. That's what this is really about is if you've yeah. got concern on language, we Some of them are going to be very easy. Excuse me. Sorry, Al. Okay. I think some of these are going to be easy. And uh, down in there in paragraphs, uh, see, it does say in the second to last sentence, it does say including destination businesses. Just give me, what's a, what's a destination business? It could be a lot of things. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a definition I wasn't familiar with. Yeah. The destination businesses, as um, opposed to non-destination businesses. Yeah. <laughs> I would say, as compared to something receive where you're driving by, they you know, receive customers. You know, just convenience. Uh, so people might go from more than just a immediate vicinity to get to it. So the kidney center would definitely fit into that category. Where you're going to draw from a catchment area, from Snoqualmie to. They have a facility in Bellevue, um, so it's going to draw from a larger area to come to that facility. And, and I think as an economic development term, that's typically correct. So it's neighborhood serving versus a destination. So even the daycare could be destination because it's maybe people from the highlands coming down. So it's not just serving that particular neighborhood like a coffee shop may do that. So. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Down in paragraph E has an odd comment in there it says uh, even that part of that first sentence it says uh, Um, sure. Uh, so, the um, affordable housing would be would be rent restricted or, or income regulated. So that would be affordable to people making forty percent of area median income, sixty percent. Market rate workforce is not rent restricted. Um, so that, but it's targeted. In our case, we call it workforce. Workforce doesn't really have a, a hard and fixed definition. But it generally goes from 60% to a to 100% of area median income, is the is the income group you're trying to target for that. So, but it's not rent restricted. When it says market rate, that generally means not rent restricted or not income restricted, I should say, um, to who can live there. So people don't have to come in and say I'm making $60,000 a unit or making $80,000 a year and I want to rent this unit. People can rent that unit regardless of how much income. Okay, okay, so if it said affordable and market rate housing, I didn't change it by that dropping the fine. word workforce at all. Same thing. That's the same thing. Thank you. Al, you, you, you said earlier how essential, you said that the, uh, maybe you used the word essential for the MFTE. How essential is it? Um, I don't think we mentioned could... down in paragraph H, by the way. Right. We, we submitted um, in our application, the, we were asked to say, you know, how important is this? And if the city were not to pass it, what, what would that mean? It, it's about a $7 million, you know, economic present value of that tax exemption. Not, that's the whole, that's not the city's portion. That's the entire tax exemption. The city's portion, I think we calculated, is about a million, to, a little over a million dollars over 12 years is the city's portion of that tax exemption. And that's a rough 
estimate on my part. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's really important to us. We, we can't make the market rate side of this work without that multifamily tax exemption. And, and just to be clear, the, the Housing Authority's portion of this already tax exempt, so we're really just talking about the market rate component here. We are under state law exempt from local property taxes. The Housing Authority is. Mm -hmm. And we can get into this detail later, but currently there are no property taxes being collected on the CenturyLink operation site. So when it's more of an opportunity cost of missing out on over 12 years, but at the end of 12 years, the city would then start to collect that um, on the residential. The land is, will still be ta taxed, so actually there'll be some additional money. Yeah, we still pay the market rate side, still the portion of the project not owned by the Housing Authority still pays property taxes on the land. Uh, it's only the improvements that are exempt. And the, the daycare pays taxes on the improvements. It's not exempt from that. I believe the Northwest Kidney Center is exempt from <coughs> property taxes because of what they do. And the uh, adult family home, if they were to go in there, is probably also property tax exempt. Regardless of you passing the multifamily tax exemption, they would be exempt anyway. So Jen, the Regarding MFTE, the mm -hmm. question that will come in front of the council in the future will be the applicability of it to market rate housing in this project. Meaning, you're saying that's what we need to communicate? I'm sorry. It's a question for you. Is it because yes. the call conversations I've been part of about MFTE was, was about an incentive to actually for to obtain was affordable housing. Gotcha. Right. This context, it's not. It's it it's, is. It basically is the residential, so it kind of helps to pay for, right? Um, so it's it's giving you a tax exemption on all the residential portion mm -hmm. of the market rate. Again, King County aside. Um, so therefore, you get you're they're able to provide the affordable housing and then the market rate. Part of the they wouldn't be able to. They wouldn't be able to. They wouldn't be able to afford the affordable housing if they didn't have that tax exemption on the whole thing. So, I'm trying to figure out how to answer that differently. Well, I thought I said Dan. Dan, I thought you said earlier that uh, the units that you would own, if I'm saying this correctly, are already tax exempt. There's no. Well, over we don't. Year limit. We don't. What I'm trying to say is that the MFTE ordinance wouldn't be essential to our component of it. But the uh, the concept here is that to be able to do an affordable housing um, project, if you will, that has both market and affordable, oftentimes requires an exemption on the whole uh, the whole parcel. And that's the way the MFT ordinances have worked in other jurisdictions, where that it provides an incentive to do both. Provides. Right. So that works. I understand yeah. now. I understand so, now. It's it's the entire project uh, right. would apply. There exactly. would be a mix. Your yeah. units would be tax exempt as exactly. it is. But this so coming forward would be an MFTE proposal for this entire project. Exactly. So that we don't have to rely on any one type of exemption that the entire project would would receive that. Mm -hmm. So. And it's absolutely critical, like, like Hal said, in order to be able to even make the economics of this work, um, and even then it's going to be quite challenging. <laughs> Some of the, <clears throat> you see a lot of these mixed use projects being built all around our greater community, all the cities, and why, why it's a challenge here in Issaquah and why you haven't seen that action here in central Issaquah, there's two big things. One, we have to build structured parking to make this transit project look the way it's going to look and to maximize the units on the site. And people don't pay to park in Issaquah. They pay very little to park in Issaquah. So if you were actually building structured parking, you'd have to be able to get $250 to $300 a month for each parking stall just to pay for the cost to build that. But in Issaquah, I mean, we, if, especially given where this one's located, as soon as we start charging people to park, which we will, they're gonna go find some place where it's free to park which is on the street or in the park and ride next door. So we, the rents of the units above are basically subsidizing the structured parking. And that's something you have to always think about as you add structured parking requirements is the rent that people are charging is what's subsidizing that parking. So that's one, what's one challenge here in Issaquah where downtown Bellevue, the people pay a lot more to park. Downtown Seattle, they pay a lot more to park. And our concrete costs just as much here as it does in those cities. 
The other thing is we, in, in the valley of Issaquah, you have really soft soils. Um, the ground is, bearing soil is 55 to 75 feet deep. We have to support this structure on auger cast piling or with a mat slab, and that adds to this site, it adds about $2 million to the site development costs that you would not have on the highlands, for example, where they have bearing soil that is up at grade. So you have an economic burden that you're at that is requirement of building in, in the valley floor that isn't in the areas when you get away from the valley. And they have to, we can't charge more for rent unless people are willing to pay it, which that isn't necessarily the case. So we have to make it up, you know, somehow. And those are the challenges, some of the challenges we face on this project, We've unique to Issaquah. What we've heard, so thank you, that's interesting, but about the soils. So what we keep hearing is that the market isn't right yet to support the, you know, the kind of units that we're wanting with the housing. And so I don't know what, that seems to be, um, the soils issue seems to be something that, I don't know what market is going to, I mean, this is the, I don't remember a better market. Right. And so mm -hmm. if we're not going to get what we want now, when will we get it? It sounds like the soils issue isn't just on your side. You're saying right. it's in the valley. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like something that we haven't actually addressed yet about how we're going to um, factor that into how we get what we want on the valley floor when mm -hmm. we have that unique circumstance. Right. I mean, it's a, it is a challenge everybody's going to face. Wow as they move forward with their developments and they need that's major mm -hmm. yeah. that's brand new that's huge new information that we've never heard right. when we are trying to say that where we are going to go is the valley floor the fact that the building conditions down there are different than the city would you figure yourself in the foot because you're not going to build on the valley floor it's more expensive to build on the valley floor. Yeah. and the retail as you require we are fortunate that we we're able to attract two good quality tenants mm -hmm. that can take up most of the commercial space. And so if you have commercial requirements, this otherwise isn't a great retail location because you know, during the day, there aren't a lot of people buzzing around there coming in to buy things where people can pay rent. So as you require commercial on the ground floor that you can't find the economic, anybody willing to pay, it makes it a challenge to develop. So Atlas, for example, doesn't have any retail. So what did you say it adds? Two million dollars. What did to I your say? Site? Two million dollars to your site? To our site. Do you have like a square foot? Yeah, uh, it's uh, 15 to 20 dollars per square foot uh, for the fund. It added premium for the foundation cost. The other factor you have to think about is it's sometimes the land value itself can be less right. because of it. Right. So it's not like you're going to pay the same amount here in Issaquah as you might say somewhere else that has bearing soil. Right. So it's, it's a kind of a more complicated mix of economic factors. But I think the, the good news is here we have kind of what's called a catalyst project. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's why you have all of these different uh, incentives to get this started. And we hope that that will kind of start to lead the way for the kind of development that you want to see here in Issaquah. And, uh, you know, and, and the land values, it all kind of intermixed. But I, I think you know, just from what I've seen, Issaquah has got great opportunities for uh, residential development and for affordable housing, something you don't see in too many other east side cities, frankly. Well, I don't need to go down that rabbit hole. I just wanted to point out that that was significant. <laughs> so I took the floor from Paul because he had questions, continuing his questions on the MOU. Thank you. And, and, and impact fees in number five, paragraph five, it does, the, the IMCs it lists cover school, traffic, park, and fire. And you specifically uh, call out traffic. So is the intent to waive all of those, school, park, and uh, fire, as well as traffic? It's currently, the IMC currently does that, yes. The, we, we specifically called out the for affordable units, affordable, so not the market the rate. Fees. So we will still be getting impact fees for the market rate units mm -hmm. in Spectrum's uh, development. But we called out the traffic one because, again, it's in this TIP, so to kind of uh, address that, because it's not. Uh, so that So the traffic impact fees for the market rate, let's say, I'm just making up numbers, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't, but if it's a million dollars to build the road and they would have had to pay a million dollars into traffic impact fees, that means they get a credit and they don't have to pay anything into impact fees. If it's lopsided either way, then they actually pay more, you know, pay into the fund, but less minus the cost of building the core road. So we just pointed that out because that's, again, uh, in our TIP currently. 
Okay, again, so so fire schools yeah. and uh, park, you're anticipating waiving those as well? Those are currently in the IMC, yes. For the affordable units. Can you change from the IMC for the recent polygon jail? It also waives the 48 units up there, 10 feet. Hold on, hold on. Let me, yeah. So the IMC says at, at um, um, 50, 70, 80. That's what all of those, uh, all, all those references to the IMC 3, yes. 63, right. 71, so, 72, and 73 so the affordable, are only affordable at, at 50, 70, and 80% of AMI. Right, so our affor the affordable that in inspection, for instance, is only at, if we do the MFT is at 80, and the ones in King County are lower. lower. 40 and 60. 40 and 60, so those do meet below those. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So maybe that's why it was not there. <laughs> good good answer yourself, Paul, <laughs> for that. All right, thank you. That was the extent of my questions okay. on the uh, language. Thank you. Hold on. This is, on. This is oh. definitely the type of information and feedback we want to get so that we are able to come back in um, August with a more formal. We're, we're anticipating we'd make red lines to this document you got a draft of. We have to get sent. We have not received CenturyLink's mm. comments yet. We have a, Jen and I have a call with them next week, mm -hmm. and we hope to get their comments in time. Also, I mean, we have we need their comments to this MOU before we come back on the third, because you go from there to the seventh, and we can't, you know, we you can sign it, we can sign it, but if we CenturyLink hasn't sure. signed it, <laughs> we're not getting very far. So, um. other questions? Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Good. I'm going thank to uh, call. Thanks, Thanks very much. Call for. Uh, Public Thanks. comment. Anybody has any comment? This is the time. Money. Here. So, uh, Connie Marsh, and um, be way easier if you had the public on board with this because they knew it was happening, but the the community outreaches after you've made most of the decisions. And it's typical for the town, but entirely inappropriate because every time you all decide you wanna do something and then you surprise the public with it, then you have to explain it all to them and they get outraged that, gee, you guys decided that you're gonna use our money and provide a tax break and we never heard about it. And now you're telling us in retrospect that you already did it and we didn't know anything because you didn't tell us. So I think yet again, you've got it backwards and it'll probably hit the fan again, which is too bad because this is one of those things that would be nice to happen, but we've just got to get out of the habit of leaving the public behind when we make these, these deals. Um, I, don't, I don't know how many times I have to say that. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'll leave my, the rest of my comments to the later item. Thank you. Next. Steve. Found a pen. Uh, Steve Pereira, 170 Northeast Dogwood Street. So a couple thoughts. Uh, one is, I guess it's the proposed spot of where the, the, the transfer development would grow to and zoning of that which seems to be at the base of sloped area has some concern for me. Uh, I very much like the affordable housing, uh, so I'm trying to weigh those. Don't have a definitive answer yet. Uh, I think there's also an opportunity here in when these things get presented, there's an educational opportunity for anybody who reads the documentation. Uh, to talk about things like affordable housing and 60, 80, 100, 120% to include that documentation and inclusion so that folks don't get taken for granted and can be informed of the subject. So I'd like to see more of that in documentation going forward. Uh, part of this, I guess also, and it's looking ahead, the structured parking concern, I would like to see structured parking as part of this. Uh, anytime we're gonna lose trees or tree canopy, uh, that's kind of what we're talking about is some sprawl and I would like to see that constrained. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else in the public? Okay, seeing none, uh, we are supposed to be 
taking action on this, uh, making a recommendation. Um, a yeah, question? and we, comments, you mean? Comment, question. Question for you guys. Comment. Yeah, I have a question too. Okay. Um, so we're going to be taking action, so now would be time for additional questions and comments from the committee. Okay. Who wants to start? You can start. So, um, uh, Keith or Jen, what is the plan? for community outreach. And actually, I'm going to bring Hal back up as well, because <laughs> we, we talked you know, about this briefly, um, but we um, are planning to um, create a website that has some basic information, and it's helpful to hear some of these questions so we can address, so we can actually link to show what 60 and 80 percent area median income is. Um, and then as far as the design process, I'll let Hal talk about that and his thinking. The. Um the timing of this King County grant kind of interrupts how we normally would have gone about doing this. And I respect what the comment made, uh, and not just about the economics of it, but just the physical attributes as well. And so we would normally ourselves host a number of open houses to talk about what the development's going to be. Um, and we still intend on doing that. We are still at a conceptual design, kind of a massing cap density capacity kind of phase just to make this application in. We, for our submission for the um, to the city, you know, we went kind of further with embellishing what it might look like. But we really like to get input from the community about what are the amenities, what are the, how does it work, how does it fit into the community, you know, what does it look like, and we're re responsive to that. So we would we would, given where we are in the summer and when this application goes in for King County, we would probably start that right after that goes in on the 13th of September. And then we would hold a number of open houses from without knowing how much money we're getting yet, but just so that we have that input from them. Because we would like to go, if we find we get the funding as we would hope for in December, you know, we're going to want to go, it's certainly with the design of the new replacement facility. And so to the extent we can get public input prior to that, then we can incorporate their comments into what we're doing as we move forward. So I would say this fall we would take that up between the 13th of September and the middle of December when we get the, um, you know, the reward or the award identification from the county. Great. Thank you. Other comments or questions? <laughs> you have something? <laughs> so, so, the, the, so the action is, is um, just approving going forward with the MOUs. Right, so if you, if, MOUs. I'm sorry, say the last part. I mean, the, 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 act, the question mm -hmm. for us, the legislative question, is approval to go forward with the MOUs. To, yeah, to recommend to the full council for approval, yes. Right. Yep. Yes. And so we do have the opportunity to come back in on August 3rd, but if you feel comfortable enough, um, we'll make the adjustments that you, you mentioned um, that could move forward. Oh, yeah. Yes, feel very, very comfortable with everything that you presented and Hal's answer to when the public engagement might start, might what it might look like would be good. Still think we need to have some sort of primer for the four council members who are not here. I'm not sure that just reaching out and asking them if I have questions is good enough. I actually think there has to be more material in the package. And also, the question about how is this different than other projects we have approved is very important, I think, for the council to understand. Even though all we're talking about is the MOU, <coughs> I think it's important that they get that information now. The presentation tonight was great. You're really very, very clear and concise, and um, I love the answer on the public outreach. I think. Okay. Plus one. Hmm? Yeah, I'm comfortable <laughs> with moving forward. Yeah, okay. You know, regular agenda. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> My, uh, On what day? Uh, August 7th. Wait, I mean, are you regular or I'm not oh. thinking consent, uh, are we? Regular, regular. Yeah, Keith yeah. questioned that. I'm like, let's check my understanding. I no, I think they were looking at each other because they're not sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right. She's on vacation. Uh, so it'll be, me, it'll be me in a wig in hell. All right. So, <laughs> so whoever's there, regular agenda. Thank you very much. Thanks to Hal and Dan for coming. Okay, next item on the agenda, Agenda Bill 7345, amending parking requirements in the Central List Quest Development and Design Standards. 
Um, this is also to be acted on tonight. Lucy Sloman. Oops. Hey, where did it go? Oh, I know what happened. I'm going to start over. Um, Okay, good evening, Lucy Sloman, Land Development Manager. So um, just to give you a little bit of a summary, I realized as I was sitting here tonight that a year ago we were doing the Central Issaquah evaluation, which led to all of this. Um, so at that time, we, you know, we evaluated uh, a selection of projects, and seven residential projects had structured pro parking and all but one of the commercial projects didn't have structured parking. Um, the moratorium was approved on September 6th and parking was one of six items. And that resulted, um, the RFQ had two questions, is Isqua parked right or not and should structured parking be required? In March, we hired a consultant team, uh, Farron Piers and with a sub-consultant of uh, Eco Northwest. On June 7th, we were before you um, and you present, uh, after our presentation um, and based on the consultant work, you recommended leaving the parking standards unchanged and implementing structured parking requirement, asked us some questions. Uh, we went off and wrote code um, and presented that to PPC Planning Policy Commission on June 22nd. Um, and they uh, recommended approval with some adjustments to those requirements. So that's the big overview. So just to take a step back to what happened on June 7th, uh, we had presentations by our two teams, uh, Farron Piers. Uh, Saving measure. <laughs> it saved a lot. Just in case faces trigger memories for you, like me. Um, so. Farron Piers um, said that the, based on their evaluation, parking minimums were set appropriately. Uh, developers were building more than the minimum. Uh, they thought there was a low risk of parking spillover and that we were going to see um, on-street parking utilization grow, um, partly, but mostly because of convenience. Um, Eco Northwest um, found that uh, structured parking greater than 50% will be a challenge. Uh, structured parking is impacted by the type of construction and development and that unique site characterization, uh, characteristics, sorry, I can't even read, um, can e more easily accommodate structured parking. So different kinds of sites uh, can handle structured parking more easily. So um, we brought you a very broad brush um, recommendation last time, which was for office 33% structured parking over 5,000 square feet for residential 33% uh, structured parking and retail uh, no requirement. It would remain encouraged. Um, and the Planning Policy Commission, so the orange highlights where things um, changed um, after their discussion. Uh, they recommended 50% for office, same size buildings, 50% uh, residential. They did not um, have a requirement on retail. That was a big, big discussion and they would like um, the staff to return in a year um, to have further discussion um, and we were recommending with PPC and EBC to have a more complete conversation. So that's the, um, and the administration supported that recommendation. Yes. Um, so um, this is the slide we spent a lot of time on last time and um, will likely tonight as well. I've added some things to it. So, oh, <coughs> we're done. Never mind. Oh. You go. Um, so um, staff, uh, so the basis uh, of this. Um, staff did an analysis of um, many structured parking projects um, or many parking, uh, many projects to see 
what kind of amounts of structured parking there were. Um, looking at office, residential, and retail. Um, the percentages, I think, just to focus on, um, there's a high and a low, which is, I think, what we brought to you before. Uh, averages were 43% for office, median of 31. Residential, average 45, median 31. Uh, retail, average 21%, median 12%. So at the same time, Eco Northwest did their analysis looking at our market, and they were in general seeing that somewhere between 25% and 50% was where projects, 25% um, to 50% structured parking in that range was where par projects became infeasible. Um, a lot of what we're discussing is how to achieve the Issaquah, Central Issaquah vision um, and avoiding unintended consequences. I think a big piece, the policy decisions um, are a big piece of what was kind of underlying uh, the conversation at PPC. The administration's recommendation of 33%, you can see that is closely aligned with the median um, that we were seeing in projects. It falls between the range, in the range that Eco Northwest had identified. And so it was a somewhat conservative recommendation. PPC was interested in a more aspirational number. And so uh, instead of being closer to the median, they're more at the average. Um, they, um, the public who spoke and the commissioners felt that we should be taking a bigger step. I think the uh, administration and staff felt that the 33% was a more incremental step that could be revisited, you know, in the same way that we're visiting Central Issaquah about every three years with a report, that that would be an opportunity to revisit that and see if we needed to take another step. PPC, as part of that aspirational approach, was recommending a bigger um, initial step. So, oh, I have a question. Um, well, there's the recommendation is no change in the, sorry, no change in the retail now? So, no change in the retail. I think that there was, um, so, from the uh, administration's perspective that there was, so if you look at um, Eco North's West range was 20, but somewhere between 25 and 50%, which was like the other uses. But when you look at the projects that have been built, there's a much lower average and a much lower median. Um, there was uncertainty about how to not impact local small businesses and how to not um, favor, say, uh, uh, national chains over local businesses. So um, with that uncertainty at this point, um, there was an unwillingness on the administration's part to put a recommendation forward. And I think because of the information we had, um, PPC, uh, although they really wanted to establish a percentage, understood the um, uh, uncertainty associated with doing that, and that's why they asked us to return um, for a conversation next year. So does that mean that, like a redevelopment with retail then, we just are gonna continue to get strip mall? It's all retail? No. Um, I, I think that there, well, I think first of all, um, we are, I think the Central Issaquah standards, um, even before we put this in place, we're seeing more structured parking. We haven't seen it with retail. Those have all been pretty small projects. Um, uh, in some of our discussions with um, potential builders, uh, we are seeing structured parking associated with retail. So I think as our land values go up and to make um, moderate to larger size projects make sense where you're getting enough value for the land to go through the cost and effort of redeveloping, structured parking is likely. But that is, um, that is still, we're recommending encouraged, which you're right, there is a risk there. So could it not be something like 
the recommendation for office. So for retail, if it's over a certain amount, it's a certain size, then some sort of structured parking, at some percentage would be required? Yes, I don't think we felt like we had enough numbers to give us the same level of confidence in establishing that. What would it take to get those numbers? So the, so the, so retail is a much harder thing. Um, you know, the, um, as Lucy mentioned, you know, even the tolerances on office, how many office projects we had to, to pick from to look for what is the tolerance level for structured parking. Retail's, retail's way different. Um, and so I know the concern that you're expressing, and that is, and it's the one-offs, you know, when we're talking about bigger projects like the commons redeveloping or with a vertical mixed-use project coming, that will come with structured parking. It's the, what about the small remnant parcels that are maybe on East Lake Sammamish how, or... How do you know that that's going to come with structured parking? You don't require it. Um, because the only way that you can fit additional development, say, on a fully developed parcel like the commons would be to add structured parking because you're taking surface parking lots to build buildings. Um, with a any standalone vertical mixed use project, you know, you will, to accommodate the required parking for all that density, it needs to be in a structure. It, you just, nobody would build a big surface parking lot with a five over one or five over two. So it's, it's the small stuff. It's the, could we get a, a another car dealer, a, a car parts store, or a, a, you know, a fast food restaurant. Yes, we could. Um, and I think if we were going to go down that path of saying, how would we address retail and those standalones, I think, you know, we would want to bring in probably a retail consultant to help us understand that. So um, in, um, in your packets, uh, Eco Northwest, and I can reference the page if you're interested, but they, they, they had a kind of interesting discussion about, so they're, you know, they're, um, they talk about between 25 and 50 percent uh, is where the infeasibility happens, but the model that they were using was based on 25,000 square feet of, of uh, retail. And, you know, we're seeing projects like, you know, the Taco Time project or the Corner Bakery, those are significantly smaller than that. And so to get to the economy of scale where you can build it is larger than most of the projects that we've had. And um, then to factor in the kinds of uh, the differences in the market um, between the number of projects that we have to look at for office versus the retail, which are all these small ones that aren't doing it, is where we're really hesitant because retail is such an important part of our community and our character. We know it's a high priority, um, but I think we're just, uh, to avoid the unintended consequences, we just feel we aren't quite there to make that recommendation yet. Thank you for having this slide up. I want to ask something about office. So the, when it says between 25% and 50% structure parking and office projects becomes infeasible, that tells me that's a pretty wide range, by the way. Right. That would tell me that some pro forma say, hey, at 26%, eh, it doesn't work. And so to go all the way to 50% with a recommendation, it seems like we're pushing up against most projects not being feasible, if I interpret the word that's on there. So um, one of the things that Eco Northwest pointed out is um, they are, of course, basing it on the, all the information that they've collected locally. And um, there are a number of variables, um, construction type, you know, the size of the site, the type of the soils, um, you know, all those many factors that we see. And I think the, um, so part of what they pointed out was that there was a validity in then also looking at the projects that we're seeing on the ground as a way of sort of um, balancing their, uh, their model against the realities of Issaquah. I mean, that's one of the challenges with looking at other jurisdictions and other projects uh, in attempting to 
uh, you know, pick up code or judge from that, there are so many variables. And so what they're essentially, I think, saying is there's this wide range. And when we look at projects in Issaquah, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, based on historical uh, information of the projects that have built is that, that the, that they're coming out at an average of 45%. And so, um, while I understand your concern, and that's why we started at a 33% conservative position, um, the, the uh, commission was hoping for a more aspirational number, which is not unlike some of the, uh, or many of the projects that we saw. And to make sure I understand, when we're saying 25% or whatever these percentages, we're saying that the parking requirement or the, the, the total number of stalls that a project is going to require, they require 150 percent are going to have, minimally have to be in structured. We, we actually would think that someone would do a mix. So, so typically there is a mix, um, at least some, because you know, you have your, you have your convenience drop-offs, you have like places where people want to pull right up to the front, go in and do something really fast and come out. Um, whereas employees, they can tuck into a garage. You know, when you look at the office that, that's happened recently, so we have an application in now for Costco, it's going to be 100% um, in garage. Um, the office building that was built on 4th, which is a medical office building, it's got it's all in garage. Well, it's got a little bit out on surface, but most of it's in garage. The Gilman Lofts project that you guys just approved through a development agreement, it's all tuck under, so it's considered structured. Um, so, so when you look at and there's also a component with office that, you know, if you're trying to really, if you, if you say, well, you know, we don't have that much office getting built in Issaquah period, and that that is getting built, you know, if you want it to be you know, Class A office, it's going to be structured parked. That's just part of the requirement from BOMA. It's part of the definition of Class A is it has structured parking. So, so I'm not, you know, again, I think whether you go 30 or 50, I think either way, Issaquah is going beyond our peer jurisdictions in terms of what we're asking developers to do, which is great. Um, whether you want to take a more conservative approach or a more aspirational approach, or something in between. I think there's not a right answer here. Um, I don't think that if there's if, not a right answer, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's an answer, at least within the range that you guys are talking about, that would cause developers to stop. Um, if you go beyond 50, I think that um, that that could be the case. People would choose to build either outside Central Issaquah or build other land uses that aren't falling into this. Requirement. Okay, so that's an interesting analysis. It does make me question the value of Eco Northwest's analysis. If they're saying between 25 and 50, it becomes unfeasible, and we're not seeing any of that, it does make me question that entire analysis. My, my other point would be uh, retail. Lucy, I think you characterize the administration's initial proposals at 33 percent as like incremental or. I forget how you characterize that. Uh, well, I said it was conservative and that we could treat it incrementally where, for instance, every three years as we do okay. our monitoring. So why not do that with retail? Because we're less confident of that number. I know you're not as confident of the, I mean, you've just communicated your concerns about office, but I think we felt that there was, um, there was less on the ground uh, information to back up the uh, uh, range that they were showing between 25 and 50 percent. Okay, thank you. And to be perfectly clear, my uncertainty has to do, we have an analysis that says one thing, we have data from the field that says another, and we're leaning toward the data on the field. That's what I'm questioning, okay. the value of the analysis we have. I, um, I think uh, Eco Northwest is a respected company, and we're not, uh, I, I think that, I think w one of the things that we said to um, PPC, and I think um, it is one of the challenges um, 
they are a rather data-driven body and would have liked to have a very specific number. And um, I think what we're trying to get a sense of is the ballpark. This is a, a something of an art and not a science. And so I'm not sure that even if we had had a significantly larger contract with Eco Northwest, that they would have been able to say 33% is perfect, 35% is not perfect. Um, so I think that we're using a number of factors to try and get us in that ballpark, but because we are um, a leader on, in, the, in the region on this, I think that we are um, having to, uh, sorry, uh, we're, we're trying to make an educated guess. Okay, and, and I'll just summarize. It, it does feel like guesswork, and I don't know that we can do any better than that right now. Questions? You ready for public comment? Public comment time. You have to you have to sing it like that too if you're going to talk. No, I'm just kidding. Hi, Steve Pereira. So I, I guess this conservative versus versus aspirational concept is really kind of at the core, uh, and these two things really banging heads here. It seems it's easier to decide up front what we want to be and grow as a city versus later try to read development to try to become what the city that we want to become. Uh, so I guess I lean towards two things. One is in studies I've seen, we're not gonna be, we're a couple years out from being at the price value where we get structured parking. And the fact that I heard today was that uh, and the soil type being different in Iroquois Valley is different than other places, it seems easier to say wait and put an aspirational goal on development. And so why not go towards the 100% now before we build out and have strip, strip parking, strip structures? Uh, it's easier to say that now and put that aspirational goal and build towards that aspirational goal with policy that allows us to have it. Uh, if we don't get it in this construction cycle, 11 miles from Seattle, we're gonna get that. Why are we rushing it? to make that wait. Uh, the other thing, another thing anyway that seems relevant is um, when we're looking at the moratorium, one of the things we saw that caused us to put it in place was uh, not having, I guess we tried to get development and it was happening outside of the CIP. And another thing seems to be happening here that maybe we could put zoning height and restrictions aren't part of the moratorium and I think zoning height needs to be part of the moratorium conversation and maybe down zone other places so we restrict the sprawl needs to be part of that conversation as well. Um, and I also think that there does need to be some retail structured parking considered as part of this. If that means we need more fine tuned numbers then we need to have part of that otherwise we're not gonna get it where we need it and we're gonna have people parking in residential zones or other places. Uh, if it doesn't come as part of this, if the structure is too small, maybe they pay some additional funds into a, into a kitty that gets used to build structured parking, not just having sprawl of uh, existing smaller construction sites. Thanks. Thanks. Honey? So I interrupted Lucy to, sorry Lucy, uh, because I actually wanted to see the exact language of what these people were asked to do. And they were asked to, to tell you about the feasibility of structured parking right now. And um, our CIP is a, a long document. And the whole reason you had the moratorium was because you didn't like what was happening right now. And so, if you if they are saying these are the these are the percentages that would allow people to do basically the same thing that they're doing right now 
well, we don't like what's happening right now. And so what we want to do is get what we envisioned, which means that you would raise those percentages, even if it takes a few years, because we want a different Issaquah. We don't want a strip mall Issaquah. And so when people say aspirational, you know, I, I, I sort of want to just spit, because what does that really even mean? And it's such a good word to spit on. But um, if you look at our goals for the Central Issaquah Plan, it is clear that we are envisioning something different. So I think you must go with a higher percentage, even at the cost of saying no, because we ha are terrible at saying no to things, even if we don't like them, we just say yes. Now, Steve had a course. If we say no in the central Issaquah area and we say yes everywhere else, then we are still not getting what we want. And that conversation has still not happened within council. So with this moratorium, uh, you do have a magic moment with council to start saying, how are we going to deal with strategically creating the central Issaquah area that we want without just having a donut hole and the rest of town grows. And that is a conspicuous absence in your policy planning. And so, yes, I realize that is outside of, of poor Lucy's <laughs> presentation. But I think the core of what Paul was saying is, no, we don't want what you can do now. We want better than that. And the community expects you to go for better and put the rules in place to make it so. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none. Any members? Comments? I have a question. Sure. So some of these comments provoked a, a question for me. The Lucy, you said it was a year ago that we gave the report card that started all of this. How many office projects, if there were six that we could look at for the basis of this analysis, and residential there were 14, and retail there were four today, what was it a year ago? What, we, what, 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 what has changed? How, what would those numbers have looked like a year ago? Do we know? And, and maybe not just the count of the projects, but what type of what percent? We probably weren't calculating. I don't know if you have your... It was so, 12 across all types? This is, this is in the city. These are not limited to central Issaquah. So, for instance, residential projects are probably evenly split or close to evenly split between our urban village and uh, or Issaquah Highlands and central Issaquah. There, I think there was one project that was outside of either of those areas. Um, retail was, um, I have a, uh, retail had, uh, one project that was before Central Issaquah, uh, two projects from Central Issaquah and one from the urban villages. Um, office, uh, one of the projects is so one of the office projects was under central issaquah some of the other ones are um, two of them are in the urban villages and several of them one was old town and the other ones were prior to central Issaquah. so we were looking over a range of years and a range of areas to try and um, look at what was happening in Issaquah, not just in central Issaquah. So I, 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 um, you know, if we go back and look, th there were seven non-residential projects that would have been a combination of office and retail and only one of those, which was the storage building, um, had any structured parking. And of the residential projects, which of course were all under Central Isqua, all of them had some portion. And actually, I think if, if I look at them, um, 
they <coughs> ranged from uh, about 30 percent with Gateway Senior, that was the lowest one. Gateway was the second at about 35, and then they ranged all the way up to 100% um, in um, Central Iskwa. So, um, office. Yes. Of the six projects looked at, the average in structured parking was. <laughs> 43% of the parking was in structured parking. Right. So of, <clears throat> of the um, six projects, uh, three of them did not have any structured parking. Uh, one of those is a fairly large building. The other two would have fallen outside below this 5,000 square foot threshold. Um, so I don't. I didn't do that calc I did a calculation for how much the percentage of structured parking for the projects that were structured, but not for the projects that um, would have been above 5,000. That would have made sense, but I didn't think of that. The recommendation would be to up at 57%, per basically from the median, 50%. 17%? Well, from 43. Oh, 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 I see. I'm 40, sorry. What did I say? You said, you said the right thing. I was going from 33 sorry, to 50 sorry. instead yes, of 43 to 50. Yes. Um, um, I'm uncomfortable. I guess I'm uncomfortable with the retail. One. Um, that just seems to not get us where we're trying to go. Um, I don't know what the answer is because we're told we don't have the data, the information we need, so I don't know what that means unless we grab some number, but. So, so if you think, so retail, just I'm gonna spend a few minutes and see if you guys get comfortable or you can handle the other two and then we can end in retail. I mean, so think about retail and how you shop. And right now, you know, where, where do you have retail experiences with structured parking? So Grandwich Plaza, so fairly big, L Square, um, any of the other malls, you know, they're structured parking. But most of the retail experiences we all have, we go to Target, we go to, you know, Trader Joe's, we do these things, they're surface parked right now. And so what we don't have a comfort level with is by mandating some structured parking with retail, what does that do to our retail market? And mm -hmm. our retail market is... Um, obviously important to the economic vitality of our community. And so that one is, seems perilous um, without having more information to make a good decision. I think the likelihood that we could have an unintended consequence with retail is a lot bigger than the other two land uses. Well, or you put a number on it. You, you put a requirement on it now that's, you know, somewhere between 25 and 50%. And it, if it has the effect of slowing while you study that further, you know, I mean, we have no choices. Can go wrong. Yeah. But, so um, I don't know that it needs to be zero, between zero and 100. And I don't know if it's a, um, uh, you know, I think we'll, what we heard in what, Steve said, you know, why, why rush to get what we don't want? I mean, that's, that's where my heartburn is. So, um, I'm, of course, I found it the first time. Um, I, you know, I think that, the, that what Eco Northwest was saying was that, um, and it's on page 98 in your packets, um, was that what they were evaluating uh, for the 25 to 50 percent that where that came from was a 25,000 square foot retail space. Um, and then the projects that we're looking at, um, you know, only uh, two of them fell above that. Um, one was Grand Ridge Plaza which had about 25% structured parking, and then Overlake had about 12% structured parking. So I think there are things that 
um, I think there are things that we can probably do to, you know, maybe it's retail over a certain size. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, this is one of those things where this is not my, this is not my wheelhouse, this is not my profession, and so I'm equally as uncomfortable just, you know, creating language that sounds reasonable to me when I don't have the, the, the information that I need to make that decision. Just a question. Sure. So what's wrong with going back to Eco Northwest and saying council wants to know what could go wrong if they picked a 50% requirement for retail over 25,000? Eco Northwest is not a retail expert, and okay. so, so I wouldn't one. use them. Yeah. You know, there are companies like Real Retail that mm -hmm. would be a better me um, measure for that. You know, I guess I would say that this, this was debated for a long time at PPC. Um, and I think at the end of the day, they felt uncomfortable. I think your staff is uncomfortable um, putting a number on retail um, because I think that it will have some unintended consequences. And, you know, obviously the council can do what they want to do, um, but the recommendation coming both from PPC and the administration is zero for retail. Are there other places in the Puget Sound region, other jurisdictions that require structured parking to some degree on retail of certain I'm size, certain perhaps, or? So n not in that way. So right now, so there is a structured parking requirement, I believe, of some sort coming out of Spring District. Um, but right now, Federal Way has had proposed legislation that is still pending and doesn't seem to be moving. Um, well, and spring, that's just, that's only for multifamily Federal spring Way. District was supposed to be our big competition. Who was? Spring, spring District, District in Bellevue. Well, maybe we need to find out what we're doing. Well, just a, a question too. So we've had some small retail projects redevelop, and I have to say, I actually think the work that you did with Corner Bakery and McDonald's to incorporate, and um, Taco Time, is that the other one? To incorporate some of those elements of site design, and I, I, I think they're good. I think it worked. I guess I'm kind of stuck in this place is that we're not gonna, from what Steve said, we're not gonna go from where we are to you know, something really quickly that, it, that looks exactly like the stuff that's at the end of the Central Esquip plan. So I'm, I'm sort of stuck in the place of if we can put something in that still allows the smaller retails to go ahead and, and get their permits and do their upgrades, great. Um, I'm kind of still shell-shocked by what's happened over the first three years, and, and I'm, I'm not convinced that being aspirational is a bad thing. We're just, we could just be aspirational for a year, and you could ask us for more money to go out and do a retail study. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure. When I look at what what I think we've lost in terms of opportunity in Central Issaquah, I'm not sure I convinced I want to leave something that loose again because I think we've not done or, or not allowed it to develop in a way that the community thought it was going to develop. I'm kind of leaning on the side, put something in there um, based on larger stores and they have to provide that much structured parking and we'll look at it in a year. And if you need money to fine tune that number, then ask for it in the budget cycle pretty gun shy right now so I'm kind of even though staff and PPC is saying they don't have enough information I'm just looking down the road and saying we're gonna some of this retail is gonna redo itself a couple of times at least once maybe before we get maybe the look we're looking for so I'm just I don't know I'm not feeling the zero and I'm going there what number what number where, where would you go but have a I think um, if based on the kind of stock that has been coming in, the projects that you're looking at that are coming in, if they're not hitting the 25,000 mark and, and you're not thinking that we have, we're going to get out of this moratorium and people are going to go, ick, look what they just did, then then let's start with the larger store. Let's start with the 25,000. Mm -hmm. I just, I just, I don't want any more, I don't want any more I guess that's where I'm going with it. So I just don't feel like leaving anything right. loose. Goal is un avoid unintended consequences, and um, we've had a lot of them. And so I'm not super concerned about un the unintended consequence of someone developing elsewhere right now because we asked for, we require what we want. That's, um, I, yeah, that's 
So where are we, are we on the other, office and residential? The, uh, I like 50-50? 50 50 50 50 50 Either you have questions yeah. about that? No, yeah. I like PPC. And actually, I'd just like to make a comment that it sounds, the meeting sounds like it was long at PPC and involved, and I probably won't get a chance to watch it, but it sounds impressive. It sounds like they really dug down, and they really were trying to listen to what the community has said about the moratorium and what we built. That's awesome. That is really good. Well, and it's the kind of co conversation that when you are trying to lead something that you're talking about, how do you, s what are the criteria you using to make a community decision? And that's that, you know, uh, conservative versus aspirational, incremental versus big steps. I mean, um, that's the kind of conversation that um, needed to happen. Okay, I, would I would propose that we have to put it oh. I'm sorry? I would propose that we have to put in some sort of percentage for retail mm -hmm. and that it should be related to a square footage for the... So then the question is, um, do we come up with that now or do we ask this to come, for this that to come back? Come for I guess uh, for staff <laughs> to come back with it, they've already kind of got a recommendation and without any more data or any more dollars mm -hmm. to ask questions <laughs> of experts, what would you come back with that's different than what you have? Um, nothing. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, so there's, there's two variables that you guys are debating on retail. It's how big is the building that would be Excuse exempt? Me. And then what's the percentage of required structured parking? Um, so, you know, I think that that's a whole kind of spin-off work project in and of itself that we would ask you guys for a budget appropriation for 2018, I mean, if, if that's what you want to do. So, so you wouldn't come back with a different number, but council putting in that recommendation would generate a project with some budget ask. Okay, fair enough. So um, just to get it started, 25,000 square feet, 50%. Dab in the dark. I haven't heard staff say, you know, you want to kill retail, do this. Yeah, and, well, and, and that's probably the wrong way to, f to phrase it. But that, and because it assumes that you just, you know, that, you know, now is the time. Um, I haven't, you haven't said anything that you said will absolutely, you know, create economic, you know, dead stagnation. zone. Stagnation or dead zone. Just, okay, no, you this just, will, you know, this will do it. So what'll Don't happen? We can always so re it, remember when we passed the Central Issaquah plan. It was, oh, but we, we can, can we can work on it. Yeah. We can change the code, and so we could do the same thing. So we put something in here, what? and then we come, and then we study it, and in a year, if you want us to change it. Yeah. So what would happen is most, and I'm just, I don't have a crystal ball, right? But what would happen is it, whatever you set that number at, twenty-five thousand square feet, ten thousand square feet, somebody wanting to build something will pick a thousand square feet less than that and not do the structured parking. That's, that's what will happen. The market will drive that decision. But you could say that about any square footage we yes. pick. And so that's exactly what happened, what's going on in the office one too. Someone's gonna pick 5,000 square feet instead of 5,001. They might. So I don't understand why it's, I don't understand why it's such a rate of horribles with the retail. Well, because I think with office, we are, we've seen projects that when it was voluntary, were, were doing this. And so um, we, that not every project did it. So there are small projects that are not doing it. There are, you know, last century projects that are not doing it. Um, you know, probably ProLiance up at, um, uh, we didn't evaluate Swedish. That's too complicated because it's MOB and hospital. Um, and so there are certain uses we aren't involved with in this. Um, but ProLiance is probably the biggest building that didn't provide any structured parking. And I think we all think that would probably have been better if it, you know, did have that. And it's a 50,000 square foot building. So I think that, um, what we what we're seeing is that we have some we have both eco northwest data 
and on the boots on the ground and Issaquah data that make us feel more comfortable making that recommendation than we would with retail. And I understand your concern, um, and but that's just why we have m m less certainty about that. What's the size so, of a 25, so give me an example of a 25,000 square foot retail so store. So here's, here's a great example, right? So this is why this is, this is the unintended consequences. So Front Street Market is empty. Um, it's about, it's, it's probably about, hey, Jen, how many square feet is Front Street? 14,000. So 14. So let's, so let's assume that somebody wants to come in and take over Front Street Market, a new grocery store. And for them, because they're a new grocery store, they want to do an addition on the front, and it takes it to 20,000. So now they have to do 50% structured parking. Um, they this would is not- citywide parking? Well, good point. So, but if it was in Central Issaquah. So, so let's take Sports Authority. Yes. Okay, so Sports, how many square feet? 40,000. 40, so that's 40. Okay, so, <laughs> so if, if somebody came in and wanted to do some revisions on Sports Authority that would add some square footage, now they have to do half of their parking as um, structured, and that is parking for retail is four per thousand? I think so. That's, so four well, per I think thousand. that's the maximum. Min so r required parking, the minimum required is two per thousand. So one per thousand would have to be um, structured. So you have to have a 40 stall parking garage. Okay. <coughs> Still not seeing right. the downside. Yeah, not seeing it. Feeling it. Okay. I think perhaps there's a, there's a dual hats thing here, DSD and ED. <laughs> <laughs> and we're coming at it. From I'm the only wearing of, one, okay. So, yeah, so I, I would, um, I'm definitely talking with my ED hat on, just yes. in case you guys were confused. No, no, no we can for sure. <laughs> I saw the so, letters ED on your hat. Yeah. So the only okay. way I would be for comfortable moving forward is to add some sort of a um, percentage and minimum square footage on the retail, and then... Um, with the caveat that we look at it in the next year and see if we hit the sweet spot. That, well, that you know, that's a budget question. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but also, it doesn't have to have the council's approval. The mayor has authority to um, execute contracts for up to fifty thousand dollars to do this kind of work. So it doesn't actually, you know, have to come through budget. Um, but I, I, I just comfortable. We 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 played the game now for four years. And um, not, not, don't want to play that game anymore. So what's going to make you comfortable? What do you, what do you need to see? Well, the only one that sticks up sticks in my mind is the twenty five thousand square feet and fifty percent. And because I don't know any different, that's the number that Eco Northwest looked at. You're you know you keep tossing out fifty percent, or somebody is, and so uh, that's the recommendation. And so I don't know any different. So um, if we're going to use those numbers just just for discussion purposes. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I know you're thinking aspirational, and that would be 50%. The somewhat more conservative would be to stick with the 25% and 25,000, because at that, that was, they were showing that it's between 25 and 50, so 25%. Did that make sense? So. Oh, comments? I, I feel like I'm, we're just operating with a lot of a big gaps of information. Yep. Uh, retail, you, someone has to put in structure and their customers. And you, we talked about housing and whether or not the housing units have to subsidize. If, as long as we don't, parking is free, the housing units have to subsidize the parking. Uh, what subsidizes the, the structured parking for retail? Well, there's even, it's probably even easier for customers to park elsewhere especially in central area because there's so much parking right now. So th so that that would that's a concern of mine that you, you that um, it, it's it's like we're 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 really focusing on one small thing but I think there's a larger context that we don't mm -hmm. we still don't understand the forces at play. 
creativity. And all, I got to say as well, too, this whole parking thing for the moratorium, it, it looks like it's coming down to going from voluntary to 50% for office, 50% for residential, onshore about retail. So that's the entire parking element of the moratorium. But no change in the standards in terms of how much parking is required. It's just whether it's in structure. Right, right. This is just about structured. Okay, mm -hmm. so. And so? This is, this is, uh, it feels like a bit of guesswork. It's been, and I can accept the recommendations uh, where Andy. they are for office and residential. So do we do I something tonight or punt it back? We gotta just close the door on this and. So I, um, I would be comfortable um, adding 25,000 square feet and 50% and uh, recommending that to the full council and then there may staff administration may have comments between now and full council um, i'm planning on reading all the information again to see if i can glean anything else that might help me i'm also going to look at some other jurisdictions i guess i'll have to go do my own homework and find out if what i can about the spring district and see if there's something else that feels more comfortable to me i you know um, I made a commitment a year ago to work um, as hard as we needed to work to get the moratorium lifted. So I'm willing to put more work into it um, without just punting it back because I know the information that I want um, to try to get. Um, but I'm not comfortable with the uh, recommendation of C. Um, but my feeling about what C retail could, could be or should be um, might change. This is just sort of a yes. 5,000 and 50%. I could support you on that. All right, so let's, let's run it up the flagpole. I have one more comment. It's not related to the numbers. And I would, would think that um, maybe um, hoping that um, staff could help with that more information gathering. Anyway, in terms That's of right. code, just to see uh, if maybe that district, yeah, yeah, see if 25 and 50 is, you know, um, those need to be changed for good reasons. Okay. This uh, last comment has to do with something that Connie had mentioned, and that is that I believe this is our opportunity to move a different direction with the central square plan and its code and make sure that we actually get the product that we expect to get the second piece of this goes back to a landing shore question from last year and that is that we know that in terms of growth of residential units that we are seeing as much growth outside of central Issaquah as we are inside of central Issaquah some of the things that we're going to propose in these work items may have the unintended consequence again of making land outside of central Isqua more de desirable that goes completely against our comp plan vision of focusing growth here completely against it so the piece of information that i asked for last year that i don't think we've seen is you had come up with a figure that had said even though we meet our growth management target in 2018 approximately for residential units we still have the capacity to build 11 or 11 000 more housing units I haven't ever talked about where those are. And for me, for each of these moratorium items, if what we're doing is tightening up this code and in the end we end up building the donut, I don't know if it was Connie or Steve or somebody talked about it, but we've made a mistake again. So in order for me to get through this, I have to know where that capacity is and that in, when we get out of this moratorium, we act on whatever other land issues we have to so that we don't push the growth out to the fringes again talking about things like requests up in the highlands for upzoning requests down a state route 900 for changing land use that's happening anyway before we do this and this could just make it worse and so while i think this might get us the product 50 years that we want in central isqua we may see the donut grow up first and that would be a travesty so i need that piece in order to actually vote on stuff like this get us out more time Thanks, Keith. I want to add a couple comments, and, and I misspoke earlier as far as the changes that we, the, it's not just adding these percentage uh, minimum requirements for, uh, there are actual amendment, and it's in the packet as well. 
So uh, including, um, so there, and there's language, there's proposed amendments, rationale, recommendation that came from PPC that had to do, for example, with uh, the uh, no administrative adjustment may be made to reduce the required provision for structured parking, like adding that, for example. There's a couple language changes like that. They're on page 57 of the packet. There's another one, amend the definition of parking the structure to clarify the carport is not considered structure parking and add a new definition of carport. So these are part of, these are part of it as well. And then there's a third one, which is, is just the, um, um, all residential uses and office uses over 5,000 gross feet square feet to use structured parking to meet a portion of the minimum parking requirement and to establish, okay, that's the one that actually adjusts. It says, that, I mean, this is the language we've been talking about. It's the third amendment that actually addresses what we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. There are these other changes. Right, and, and, and we, we didn't focus on that. I mean, it is part of our recommendations page that there were no exemptions in terms of certain uses that were excluded. Um, that was in our memo also that, for instance, affordable housing um, isn't excluded from that. Um, and in terms of adjustments, I think the message that we have gotten from council is if this is our expectation, this is our expectation. And so it was added to the list um, where it is not available for adjustment. Um, uh, now, that is contrary to what Eco Northwest recommended. They recommended a variance process, um, which would, um, you know, adjustment is if you have a better way to get there. Variance is hardship. Um, and we discussed that and felt that that was not really what we were hearing from council and PPC and the community. And so we did not establish that or propose that. So. Are we all in agreement to move this mm -hmm. forward with the recommendation yes. Yes. with what we discussed? Okay. Consent. <laughs> right. How about a special, we'll get you one a of separate special we'll, meeting? We'll get you. I think there may be um, something later on the agenda we can do eventually. We're trying. We can yeah. just keep swinging. All right. Thank you. Thank Next you. Next item on the agenda, Agenda Bill 7433. Annexation of King County Island and establishment of pre-annexation zoning. Um, Trish Heineman. Yes. Any policy manager? Um, okay. Um, we you have two annexations before you tonight. The first one is um, the King County Island potential annexation area, and tonight. We want to go over the schedule, review some of the specifics on this parcel, um, talk about the proposed pre-annexation zoning, I have a committee discussion. Um, I think there'll probably be some audience comments tonight um, related to this issue, and then we'll talk about the next steps. Um, the process timeline for both annexations, um, you met on June 5th on this agenda. Bill, you passed a resolution of intent to annex. We uh, set two public hearing dates for the pre-annexation zoning, two, uh, 30 days apart, and you all asked for additional information to be presented um, in the packet for tonight, and that's in your packet, and that was uh, existing zoning, proposed zoning, what community facilities zones included, um, some different topo maps, so those are all in your um, packet tonight. On June 6th, the day after you did the resolution to um, move forward, we finalized our submittal to the State Boundary Review Board. They should be done with their review July 14th, which is the 45-day timeline that they have. Um, tonight, July 6th, as you're reviewing this before it goes uh, July 17th to the first of the two public hearings on the proposed um, pre-annexation zoning. The next one then is September 5th which um, if you're comfortable with everything, then you can not only make your decision on the pre-annexation zoning, but you can also make your decision on whether to annex the parcel or not. Are there questions on the schedule? And as you heard from Jen previously, the September 5th um, timeline fits really well with the TOD timeline for their grant application. 
Um, this is the parcel. It's over by our King Con our shop site. Excuse the, me. Excuse yes. me. You just said parcel. Yes. Good. I want to make something clearer. It's there are multiple parcels, parcels here. Yeah. It's just all in unincorporated King County right now. Right. Right. It's better called an island because it's three, three parcels and a part of a parcel that's already in the city. So even and though right even though there's way more than three listed in this table is in our packet as well. Right. There one, two, three, four, four parcels right of way that's not considered a parcel and part of a parcel that's already in the city. Okay, thank you. So it's a plethora of pieces in the parcel. It's a piece um, of land. The, um, the big piece that we find out we just closed on is zoned um, mineral. The washed out parcels are different sorts of residential, which I thought was very interesting. And the little teeny piece of the Burgess property um, is, is considered intensive commercial. Are there questions on the existing zoning? And the, the whole, um, we don't zone right of way. So the part um, to the west of the yellow, even though that's in this island, it doesn't get zoning because it's right of way. And those are stormwater ponds. Questions on existing zoning? Proposed zoning, um, and we're not completely sure with how it all is, where the dashed line, lines go on the parcel that we just purchased. Um, the bottom part would be intensive commercial so that we could move CenturyLink. The middle portion, which is the slope, would be community facilities open space. And as you know, we're still working with um, the school district to try and figure out the smallest possible parcel to which they could put uh, the urban elementary school. So that that boundary line is fluid so far. We still haven't quite figured out what that line is, but we're working together to figure out what the smallest site would be. Um, are there any questions on, oh, and all the washed out parcels would be community facilities facilities. We don't want them to be residential. Sorry to go back here. You, again, you no, just said ahead. we just purchased a parcel. The King County Road site. So, and that, and so, which one on this map is it? Um, it's easier to show you on this. It's the blue one, and it has at the bottom. You can sort of see the shadow where the shop site is now, with the big loop-de-loop -loop and the big shed with parking. But they own, um, they used to own, all of the blue. So that's what we purchased, and Correct. and yet for the entire island. This is zoning for the entire island, even though we just own one parcel. Right, right. We would like to put pre-annexation zoning on all of it, even the land that we do not own, which is customary when you do annexation like um, with South Cove, with Klahani, that we didn't get. But we put pre-annexation zoning on it so that when they came in, it would have the zoning that we wanted instead of comparable zoning. So flip to your next map. Mm -hmm. So what you are proposing zoning, you're actually splitting certain parcels into multiple type zones. Again, it, it, we're, we're trying to stay on our parcel. It's just the way that the map is drawn. But so we would process um, a, a short plat along concurrently with the zoning and the annexation so that it would actually create three parcels potentially. Assuming the council wants to zone that upper parcel of our new property, CFF. That's still a conversation point um, in the process. Right. So if not, we could create two. So at the end of the day, the IC parcel, to create an IC parcel at the bottom, which can then be part of the conversation about TOD and, and giving that to Spectrum to give to CenturyLink, you know, so that needs to be its own parcel. And then we've talked about at least having a forested hillside that's part of Mountains to Sound, so that's CFOS. And then if the council wants to keep the top of the property forested, you could just do basically two parcels and make the whole thing at the, from the middle to the top CFOS. If on the other hand, the council wants to create the opportunity for a school site up at the top, then you would want to create three parcels and that top one would then be zoned CFF. Hopefully that helped. And I think what Trish was saying is that 
that rectangle right now that says CFF, that likely does not represent the dimensions of the property mm -hmm. if at the end of the day you guys feel like that could be a school site. It would be smaller than that, I believe. Right. That's something we're working with um, ISD on right now. You said the platting would be done concurrently with what? With the annexation process. So right now, so we own the property. So we can do, um, basically start working on the platting. And then once it's in our jurisdiction, then the short plat can actually occur without having to go ask King County to do the permitting. So the annexation would actually occur first. Right. Because it's because the yes. the platting Official doesn't have anything to do with the annexation process. Right. Right. Officially it would have to happen first. But since we would own it. No annexation. No, annexation okay. first. But Just behind like, the yes. scenes we would know what we would hope for for the short plat. Um any more oh keep going. Can you go back one slide, please? Mm-hmm. So um, the, the wash dots that are residential that you're proposing to be CFF? Yes. Why not CFO? Because it's the state and they are talking about maybe there might be some facilities there, like either a stormwater or water reservoir or something like that, and they weren't in favor of, of it being open space. If I, the other, the, the, the first item we discussed this, this evening, the, I think we call it the property. No, wait, what was it called in your, your package? The TOD? Replacement property. Yes. So go back to the picture. Oh, it's harder to see. Shows the, it show, it would, would be very helpful to see an overlay. And I realize, so, so, but, Thank you for the numerous maps that you put in. We have a couple. I'm not sure what the red one is, the LIDAR. I'm not sure what I learned from that. I certainly see the, the topographic map, and, I, and you, you, we can see what's steep and what isn't. There's also the letter from the um, school district, which mm -hmm. draws a seven-acre, roughly a seven-acre box as well. And, and this idea of zoning, we... we you know, the administration is laying out potential uses, different uses for this parcel. And it's, I think we're very close to being able to imagine what that would look, what the proposal would look at like at potential build out. It would be great to have that kind of overlaid, especially on the, um, so you could see, you know, you know, does it fit within the, the, the flatland that's there right now? Does any of this have to get in the steep slope where there's forest today and also the school part, potential school part on the top? Uh, how much of that, and this might be premature, what I would try to understand is that if that, if, 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 if we zoned it CFF and then did this short plat and then followed through with the school district, would like to know what what we think the impact in terms of what, what would be developed what, what what trees would have to come down how much soil roughly are we talking are we, how much flattening needs to go out we just had a big conversation about that on Bergsma of how much how much uh, material have was going to leave the site and that that raised a lot of concerns and and I know it's all very early right now but I would like to have a better idea of at from what all the uses that you are putting on the table for us to mm -hmm. consider, what would it look like on this land okay. that is ours today? So I can, I'll address the relocation site for Century Lake at the bottom. Okay. So it is not going to go into the, the steep slope. We remained within the area that they are currently using. And so, um, uh, so where you see kind of that roundabout road mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. approximately. Um, and so it's about a three acre site. Um, so we actually, you know, uh, had a, had the survey and that's the, that's the work that um, our development partners are working off of and that CenturyLink is aware of and, and sees, you know, again, in concept plan that can fit on that. So there's no going in and, you know, into the steep slope at all for the CenturyLink. There's, you know, again, we'll, we'll gather more information about the upper side.
you'll get more information. Yeah. We can have a further conversation about the up, about the, the CFF site. So I don't know that we have all the details of how much dirt is going to be moved and et cetera. So that, but I'm just saying for right now, I, I know the answer to that for the relocation of Century, potential relocation of CenturyLink. So before we get to the hearing, um, the, you know, the map that you asked for showing mm -hmm. the three parcels as proposed, we can do that map. Right, before the 17th. Can you talk a little bit about the, pro the code proposal that's going to come forward um, regarding uh, urban schools and um, that's going to public hearing next week at PPC. That, would that um, affect this site? If it's approved. Okay. So, um, isn't, wouldn't that need to be approved? I mean, is this cart before the horse? No. Why? Um, because that's a citywide change, mm -hmm. um, and there's a process associated with evaluating that. You know, at the end of the day, you guys, um, you guys can decide either CFF or not CFF here. Even if you decide CFF, you could wait and decide what happens with that code amendment to influence whether or not you decide to sell that property to the school district. Just because it's CFF doesn't mean you've automatically made that decision to sell it to the school district. That's a whole other process. Right, and leaving it, having it be. Uh I'm mean, going to be CFO, you can change it to CFF later. I guess my question is, what could go wrong with that? Like, I'm going to be CFO now, learn more about what urban schools look like, what their footprints look like, learn what a proposal might look like, and consider a change to CFF. So, um, so, so you could do that. That's obviously a choice, um, and I think the school district would have some I want to weigh in on that if that is ultimately where the committee thinks they would like to go. I think if you think that this is a valid school site, um, I don't want to say that seems disingenuous to go ahead and zone it OS now and then do it F later. Um, it seems like if you today feel like this could be a good spot for a school, then let's get you the information that you need to feel comfortable that that's the right zone to put on this piece of property. Um, and so I guess. We can do it either way. Um, you know, you, you guys can choose to go down either path. Um, but if part of your hesitation about F is issues about uh, building heights, we've already flown a balloon from the top of the property at 60 feet to see if it was where it would be visible from. So we have some of that data that we can give you to help you either feel comfortable or not. Um, Paul has mentioned trees. Um, I think we can talk about if that code amendment goes through as proposed, um, you know, what would that do to um, the trees on that site and how much would be retained? As the property owner, you also have the ability to make some other stipulations um, when you sell that property. So if there's certain pieces of the code that you don't like, you could potentially put um, restrictions on that as part of the sale of the property. So there's, I mean, there's ways to get at maybe the concerns that you might be having about that, but you have the choice. A follow-up question to that. So, um, it's not what it's finally going to end up being, whether it's a school site or something else. I don't think our council is particularly, at this point, and tonight in particular, familiar with how to site schools or you know, this parcel may be available, but if you're looking at the city as a whole, um, is this the right location? Is, is this, well, I, I, know, I know that people can talk about, it, but it, oh, it feels like we're being asked tonight to make a decision that could come back in two years that says, well, you already went down the path. You know, council already decided it's CFF. And so that was the first step towards making a school site. I feel like I have no idea. And I don't know tonight that I can get enough information to say. And, and so, and I don't think you need to do that tonight. I think part of what the ask is, you know, and Trish, let me know if I'm wrong. So, so things are happening at the BRB right now in terms of the donut hole, multiple parcels. Um, and I think at some point you guys are going to have to make a decision about our property 
and whether it's two parcels or three parcels and how it's zoned, that doesn't happen tonight. Um, that doesn't happen, I think, even, I mean. Until September 5th you, is the second public hearing on the pre-annexation zoning. So you have until then to gather information, ask us for information, because um, the first hearing is the 17th of July, I believe, and the, um, and the second of two is September 5th. So that's when you would have to, if you chose to, set the pre-annexation zoning for all the parcels and choose whether or not to annex the whole property to the city. So there's still time. Tonight it was just a work session to get you more familiar with the parcels before the first public hearing on the pre-annexation zoning. No, actually tonight was for action on mm -hmm. whether, we re whether we are recommending, whether we want to recommend to the full council that we, um, that we, uh, what zoning we want on the parcels. That's what the, it wasn't, it's not a work session, it's for action. Well, I mean, I'm using that term loosely because you had asked us a lot of questions on June 5th that you wanted to work on informally tonight before the actual public hearing on the pre-annexation pre zoning. You wanted to know the adjacent uses, you wanted to know, so that's why we had this session before the public hearing for you. Bob? Hi, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. I'm not and you are? Bob Harrison, city administrator, thank, thank you, you. <laughs> chair. Um, so from our standpoint, I think kind of what's driving this piece is the commitment uh, with the CenturyLink parcel, mm -hmm. because we need that applicant needs to really have a well-defined understanding that this use can move there. Mm -hmm. If the other portion was undecided at this point, could we go to the boundary review board? Could we do the property split first? go to the boundary review board with those pieces that we know. And if we got to spend three months or four months with the school district to finalize what their site would kind of look like, and we'd be able to go back to the BRB for that remaining portion or no? We don't, Actually, so we don't have to go to, we don't, so BRB doesn't care. So, yeah. so we can right. put, so as long as we have zoning and you know, it can be OS if that's a more comfortable decision, you know, what would happen then is if that zoning gets put in place as an annex that way, and then there wants to be a conversation about rezoning it to CFF, and that's fully executed within the city. Right. Yeah. So, so I get that. So, but the other option is if you just leave a portion in the county and do the annexation later, you Ooh. could do that, right? Yeah, we don't want to do that. Yeah. I know. Well, we, that was the reason why we bought all these county parcels was to get them out. But if right. there was a desire uh, to have more detail, which I kind of heard, that would be another option. It's not the greatest right. option, but it would be another option. I, I don't think, think right. BRB would approve it if we left part of it in the, if we Left it in the county with a understanding, okay. Right, because well, then it's the sheriff. That's why I asking the question. Yeah, because then <laughs> they have to provide services, and I right. think King County wouldn't want that either. Right, I, I think the other piece too I just wanted to raise was, while we've talked about the upper bench as being because we, we, we definitely, the administration has a preference that it be a school site. But there is other zoning that you could put on the site too, right? You could put single family or you could put other uses on the site. Um, so when council is looking at those options. Um, CFO. Right, I'm just saying that okay. when we look at reselling that upper bench though, um, you know, zoning and all those things end up rolling into the final price, I suspect, in terms of what the uh, appraisal might be. <clears throat> that was that was very helpful, and I guess my concern goes back to. We haven't had community comments, have we? Nope. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question would be, when does the community get to join in the conversation here? And so maybe we'll let some comments from the public happen and see where they are on it. But it feels like to me like schools. we're walking down a path, and we're not even aware of what we're doing. The uh, schools were also here. They wanted to present some information to the sure. committee tonight as well. Questions? Any more questions? Sage, no. Um, does the committee mind if before we go to public comment, I invite school district representatives to present what they would like to present? I think we have uh, put the map back up. superintendent here and Ron Teeley and Steve Crawford. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having us. Yeah.
couldn't think of a place I'd rather be on a sunny <laughs> July night. <laughs> No, I can't, we appreciate I can't the opportunity. think of about 10 other places that I would like to be not tonight. It's weather. Mr. Crawford does have a few PowerPoint slides we'd like to walk you through as we talk about uh, the potential use of this property up by Swedish Hospital. Let's see, your system. Uh, slideshow, Steve, go one more. There you go. From beginning all the way left. There you go. There we go. So, so I, I guess I would only ask that because we're not deciding about a school, that. Um, we keep it on the briefer side. We can see the slides, but we're not just, we're not going to be deciding about a school. Yeah, we'll so we'll kind of roll through them. Quickly. Thank you. Yeah. Should you just be able to hit the return button, Steve? Or the, down. Or the, ground. the arrow down. This one. There we go. All right. So why is it a good site for an elementary school? Clark Elementary is going to have a projected enrollment in 2017-18 of 808 students. It's our largest elementary school we've added more classrooms there than we have in any other school it's still going to open with 10 portable classrooms grand ridge elementary uh, projected to have 735 students there's 125 kindergarten students that are currently transported to challenger and endeavor elementary schools grand ridge all grand ridge also has 10 portable classrooms this just shows you uh, what the attendance area boundaries are for Grand Ridge doesn't quite get down to Highlands Drive, and the Clark Elementary serves the rest of the surrounding area, including a uh, considerable area. Uh, just a little bit larger scale map of the Grand Ridge attendance in case there was any questions there. This shows how the Grand Ridge attendance area is split with the pink area kindergarten kids going to Challenger and the kindergarten kids that live in the green area going to Endeavor. Uh, Endeavor's off of Duthie Hill Road, Challenger's in the Kalahani subdivision area. Um, Esqua Valley takes care of the Valley Core area with the Clark area uh, coming just to Front Street. So 2016-2017, there's 80 Grand Ridge kindergarten students that are transported to Challenger. There's 45 Grand Ridge kindergarten students transferred to, transported to Endeavor. There's 337 Highlands elementary students that are transported to Clark. There's 173 elementary students in the Black Nugget Overdale area that are transported to Clark. 510 students are transported out of the area to Clark. Well, that's from the Highlands specifically. And if you include the Overdale Black Nugget area, it's 635 students are transported to Clark. And I say transported because we provide bus service, but there are some that get transported by their parents. So if you look at the trip generation numbers per student from our Clark traffic study, those students generate 82 a.m. peak trips, 173 afternoon peak trips, and the p.m. peak is another 107 trips to and from Clark. So there's 362 trips every day of trips related to those students being transported to Clark Elementary that are coming through the urban core, 2nd Avenue, Front Street, et cetera. Reducing enrollment at Clark is critical to accommodate core area growth at both IVE and Clark. We need capacity down here for the growth that's coming. Grand Ridge Elementary is on a 10 acre site. Going to an urban school plan, a three story building with its compacted footprint, reduced surface parking, including structured parking and smaller play areas, allows reducing the proposed footprint to about seven acres. OSPI recommends 10 acres for an elementary school. Getting to seven acres is condensing things pretty much as far as it can go. This is a conceptual plan of the site, and this is the northwest corner of the King County parcel that you required. And basically, you're, there is uh, Swedish parking in this area currently. Swedish hospital is in this area. There's a new residential development that's under construction in this zone. 
So basically accessing off the north end, coming in, structured parking to reduce the surface area there. Um, we're proposing this would be a three-story building and that allows us to compact the footprint pretty much as far as we can go in any kind of realistic sense. And we have some hard surface play area around the west and south side of the building. Uh, two covered play areas, which is typical for a new elementaries. And the uh, provision for three, although we generally go with four uh, future portables to accommodate flex growth patterns. And a sand play field on the south end here. Topography of the area is such that there's kind of a hump on the north end. There's a valley, a low spot in the middle, and another hump down in this area. So yes, there would be some grading that would tend to level out those areas. The admin area and the, par the parking would be set down into grade. The admin area would be at the mid-level of the three-story building, which then steps down as the site's going downward, uh, reduces the overall height, and the sand play field is kind of a, a balance in this area. So what we're really showing here is that uh, the western side of this footprint would pretty well correspond to the west leg of the dog leg of the parcel that you acquired and that uh, you sort of follow a contour level from there back on around to the southeast and yes there'd be some grading on the top the trees around the west and the south side would remain in place and those trees are going to screen the building from views from the south and from the westerly areas. The school building will be compatible with existing Highlands residential and commercial development. A neighborhood school serves the local community, reduces transportation, and enhances sustainability goals. It's a great spot for a school. Thank you, Steve. I also wanted to thank Gail Morgan, our Director of Transportation. She put a lot of those numbers together for us. Uh, one comment, too, about the, obviously, the advantage of not having to transport that many kids down, off, um, down to the valley floor. You're not simply replacing those trans transit trips with other transit trips because a good chunk of this school would ultimately be a walking school as well. So you literally could take cars out of circulation. You know, when I've gone around over the years and uh, done bond presentations and talked about sc building schools, one of the things that I've always told people is, because the first question they always ask me, where are you going to put them? Where are you going to put the schools? Well, we, we never know that in a bond campaign because we have to purchase the land and all that. But one thing I always say is we try to put them as close to where the kids are as we can because we believe that's the most sustainable. It, we recognize the impact that we have on uh, traffic and so forth. So um, just the idea of this site is very, very appealing to us for all the reasons that Steve just mentioned. Um, I'm sure it would be very popular in that community as well. Thank you. So um, it's, it's very tempting for me to um, say, let's ask questions, but we're not, we're not, we're not um, having discussions about um, the merits of your proposal. Um, and so I'm, um, I'm really hesitant to do that unless you know, we, we could ask a whole lot of questions, yeah. but that's really not what's on the agenda. That makes sense. It does. I, I would like to just make a brief comment. Thank you for the information, especially the, the layout and the numbers. Uh, it, it is part of the, we do have a large decision to make. It's got yeah. multi pieces to it. So thank you for preparing that. Thank you. And bringing it forward this evening is helpful. Yeah. Great. Glad you're available to come. Thanks for the opportunity. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Then we're going to go to public comment. bigger than we expected originally, and so that's why there's a desire for a second site? Bigger than the master um, agreement expected? Yes, so, and that's for two reasons. So one, there everything that c could convert to residential converted to residential. Yes, there was also additional enhancement units and then TDRs. Yeah. But also a big function of that is there's more kids turning up in apartment complexes than what was originally envisioned. 
I mean, the, the old school of thought was sure. the departments generally don't okay. generate a That's big it? kid population. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Sorry. Thanks. All right. Public comment. Connie. Um, so what is remarkable about the, the zoning here is when you look at the forested slope, which you can basically see how much of it is zoned uh, CFF, um, the wash dot parcel CFF, which means they could develop large buildings on those slopes and the trees would be gone. And uh, the intensive Commercial, not so bad. We aren't going to see it. I'm for that section. So don't get me wrong. I'm loving that section. Uh, the steep slope area that we're calling CFO is unbuildable anyway. So that's going to stay forested no matter what we do. And then the top of the hill, which uh, you can actually see the development already of the Esquah Highlands through the fringe of trees. So the highlands would then become visible if you cut the the trees at the top of that slope. So now when we look at the different zoning capacities and our, our uh, duking it out policies and our comprehensive plan, right now in our land use uh, segment of our comprehensive plan, we are very strong in protecting our forested hillsides. It is in our vision statement as a priority concern. And um, so well, I believe that Issaquah Highlands for example, would need a school. I don't think that what we want to do is create a zoning that would allow for the uh, main, one of our main visions and our comp plan to be compromised. I think it would be better to go with a uh, open space zoning, intensive commercial, and then I would like to understand exactly what WashDOT is intending with their CFF zoning on those parcels and what impacts that that might have. Because if their current zoning is residential, I don't know why we wouldn't uh, transfer it over as res residential, except for they say they don't want it. So there seems to be some information missing out of those zones that I don't understand the rationale for entirely. So maybe if they had an argument as to what their future was, that would be appropriate. Um, so competing uses for land and also uh, Mr. Harrison talked about selling the top parcel, uh, which was interesting. If indeed you were looking at this to maximize funding, you would indeed put zoning on that where you would get the most amount of money. So as soon as you put CFF, you are very much limiting the amount of money that you could get by selling the parcel. As soon as you turn it into a zoning that allows commercial or residential, if money making is your primary concern, then you get the money. So I think there's a lot of considerations here. How much would it be worth if it was zoned in different areas? And seeing that we already have cleared land in other parts of the Issaquah Islands that could potentially accommodate a school, uh, what, what are those areas so that you can understand your zoning concerns more completely? And again, I'm going to reiterate, intensive commercial, less than CFF for WashDOT, and clearly, an overwhelmingly open space for the top parcel. Thanks. Thank you. Eve? Hi. So I largely won't repeat Connie's comments because she's articulated, articulated it quite well. Uh, just, I again, the vision for Issaquah was the slopes, the city area would be maintained, not developed. I would lean more towards CFO, not towards the other building use on the site. So I do understand Issaquah Highlands winding to school in that area. I'm not sure that this site is the best site for that. So I think that at this point isn't part of the equation. Again, what's the best use of the land? It's within the vision of uh, our treed slopes. Thanks. Thank you. Corey? Uh, 
Uh, Corey Christensen. Um, I'd like to echo the other people's comments about how these uh, parcels should be zoned open space. And actually, I think they should be permanently protected open space and maybe be a um, transfer of development rights uh, hold or uh, receiving site. Um, as far as the entire TOD project, um, briefly back to the multifamily um, uh, exemption. People in my neighborhood, when I talk about, when they talk to me about this, they're, they're rather ambivalent about this entire project. And when they start hearing about the uh, tax exemption, they don't like it because when you talk about a city share, that's only a little bit. In the property tax, there's schools, there's parks, there's all this other stuff. And so it's actually a fairly big um, ask of the citizens. Now, the part, that's not the part that actually pushes people over. The part that pushes people over is seeing these upper three parcels potentially stripped of their trees. And the people in, in Issaquah have been very clear, very consistent about protecting the environment, um, open space, large part of our uh, park bonds, we vote to buy open space. And um, I've lived in my house for 23 years. 23 years ago, there, there were just trees. Treed Hillsides was the Issaquah Highlands. Treed Hillsides was Talus. And we remember that. We didn't fight the Issaquah Highlands. We didn't fight Talus. And, but now, people are upset about Bergsma. People are upset about Talus 9, because Talus 9, one of the, the contributing factors there were trees being taken down and the mud slide down uh, Talus Drive and so on and so forth. This is just another example of more of the same, and this treed area is actually the last stand. It's not just one little parcel in, uh, you know, that you can just say that, that, that is the, that, that, that pe it's, it is the last stand. I just, it, I, I, I'm at a loss for words because I can't actually believe you are even considering taking the trees down on this parcel. That's how I feel about it. Uh, lastly, when you, when you put up your timeline through September, people have been asking me, how do we fight this? And we're not waiting till September to start fighting this. We're going to start fighting it now. And I don't mean to sound threatening, but the fight it, it will, will not be just those trees. It's the entire project. And so if you really like the entire affordable housing concept, if you like moving CenturyLink, I think you have to ask yourself, what is the public benefit? Or and actually more, what is the public takeaway? You know, you've got, uh, you're, ask, you're making a large ask in taxes for the public. You're asking a large ask for the public as far as accommodating a lot more cars and not contributing anything to infrastructure. You're asking us, again, to accommodate a lot more people for our parks and no, no money for that. And you're asking for people, more people poured onto Newport Way than it already is gridlocked. And on top of that, you're asking us to give up our trees, our last stand. So, no. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Anybody else? Public comment? Seeing none. Okay, back to the committee. So, um, our specific ask tonight, Trish, is whether we want to recommend to the full council that we um, annex the area, right? Um, we've already done the resolution sorry, to sorry. move forward. Is it just the zoning? Right. It's to, um, we've already advertised for the public, the first of the two for the 17th. Okay. So I think the ask was, do you have any more questions that you would want us to try to answer for the 17th? So do we not make a recommend? So everything's already rolling. This is just, I think if, so what we're trying to do, I think is to give you guys whatever additional information you would find helpful to have the pre-annexation conversation more conclusive than this conversation has been, right? It does say for action. Though. It does say it for say action. for information. And as I recall, when it was at the council when we referred it here, I specifically said, this is coming to land and shore, we'll have more discussion there, plus it says action, so I'm a little bit confused. Um, 
Yeah, I see that there's an A on the land and shore, um, but I had always thought this was just for you to gain more information and discuss what you had asked for on June 5th, because everything else is rolling, as Keith said. But and is that because it's quasi-judicial? We don't make a recommendation? It, it is that. Okay. I'm still confused. I am too. Because we technically up. didn't have to have the um, this in the middle of the two public hearings, but you had asked on June 5th, you thought it would be a good idea to have sort of a, a discussion with more information before you went to the first public hearing. No, I don't think we asked that. Mm -mm. Uh, that's, I have zero recollection of that. Um, I figured that it was the regular process to get referred to Land and Shore for recommendation out. We didn't even discuss that it was quasi-judicial at the time that we talked about this at full council. So, um, so my confusion is when it, when it means it's rolling, what action did we take on this, AB? On June 5th, you um, approved the resolution to move forward. Um, if you look on the cover of the agenda bill, it says um, the proposed resolution declared the city's intent to annex the King County Island. You included the boundaries. You stated the annexation area will assume the proportionate share of indebtedness um, as of the effective date. You set two public hearing dates for considering the pre-annexation zoning, and you set a public hearing for the actual annexation hearing. And you authorize the administration to proceed with the annexation by submitting the notice of intent to the Boundary Review Board. That was all done on uh, June 5th. Yes, but if you go to the last two lines, refer to the July 6th Council Land and Shore Committee for review and recommendation. Am I missing something? No, you're right. That's what it says. That's what we're doing. Oh. Oh. City committee. administrator, what are we? What's the? What is the process? What's? So. Well, so. Well, so I, I think I, the the question is yeah. really about you know is this inconsistent with what we're supposed to do with quasi judicial? Are we supposed to make a recommendation? Um, it was not my understanding that we were just going to chat about it and provide more questions. Um, so, you know, having read the agenda bill, I guess what I would say is the agenda bill is looking for a recommendation coming out of this committee for establishing the pre annexation zoning. zoning. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, if the Sorry committee is ready to make that recommendation, then that would be the action that would be taken this evening. Okay. If the committee's not ready, it can stay in committee um, because we're having more land and shore meetings before September 5th, mm -hmm. right? Sure, we can. And I'm not concerned about whether we're ready or not. I'm guessing that we are. Um, that's what we were told in our agenda bill that we were going to be doing. So that's what I was thinking about when I was reading it. But my concern is, are we doing something that out that is outside what should be done if it's a quasi-judicial process. Right. That well, would be my concern. Right. Your um, agenda bill talks about the two public hearings, that the first one, the public may offer testimony and you can talk about it, but you don't have to make any action at the first public hearing. Um, I think the intent is to keep an open mind, see if there's any questions that come up that you'd like us to research, which is why the state requires 30 days in between the two hearings on pre-annexation zoning, so that there's an, a time that you can get, we can gather information to help you make the decision. So here's where so I would. I, so if you will give me one more opportunity. I, I th so for me, it seems inappropriate for you guys to make a recommendation without hearing the public comment. And the public the testimony. Public comment. Right? Okay. I mean, because you're, you're basing it based on the three comments you've heard tonight. And you may get, you know, 100 people from the Highlands. I don't know what you'll get, but it seems like making a recommendation is premature in advance of the hearing. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why you have a hearing, is to help inform, ultimately, the council decision. Right? So there, it wouldn't come back. So we're, we have a time sensitivity, do we not? So if we have two public hearings, one on July 17th and one on September 5th, it wouldn't be appropriate then, based on your rationale, for us to make a recommendation at all before September 5th. 
So, um, so I guess what maybe what we do is we hold off and I don't know. I would agree that that would be most prudent because you haven't had your public hearings yet on the zoning. Um, would it be appropriate then to make comments? Questions, con I mean, concerns we have about the proposed zoning. Sure, and, and then that gives us a chance to research or provide more information or whatever before the 17th. That, that gives you all a chance to research it well, as well what Land and Shore's role should be in this. Right. Clarify. Um, are there more questions? that you want us to research other than, I had a few from Paul, um, what would all of the uses be and how would it be built out with a short plat? And I have the one, um, what would what is WashDOT um, thinking about for the future of their land uses? Those are the two that I have, that I heard. Yeah, I guess on council. that second one on WashDOT is that um, I'm a little uncomfortable with that zoning. So, so I'll, uh, I'll speak up for my peer who decided he wanted to go home and have dinner. So when we, when we purchased Park Point, um, we basically took, oh, so the way our water reservoirs work is reservoirs have to be at a certain elevation to serve a certain portion of the city. When, so the water plan that we have um, showed a 297 reservoir on Park Point. And when we bought Park Point and preserved it as open space, it displaced a critical piece of our infrastructure necessary to serve water on the valley floor. And so as you, as you go around the city and look for another parcel that's at the 297 band, these ones are at the 297 band. So Sheldon has have been having conversations with WashDOT about whether or not the city could purchase, the water utility could purchase one of these properties, build a water reservoir. Conversation then turned from WashDOT to Mountains to Sound. How could you do that and not have it visible from the freeway? And so that's kind of where this is. Um, but I guess, and, and I don't know what conversations have been had with WashDOT about the pre annexation zoning. It could be similar to, um, I mean, so you know, you could do it CFO and then come in later and change it to CFF if the city bought it for a water reservoir. You know, that, that option's there too. Um, I don't know why all of it is showing up as CFF, because you, know, you only need one of them for a water reservoir, and I don't know what else would happen on the rest of them. So, so. here's where I think we are. I think um, the committee members should um, provide some comments if you're comfortable doing that now, or if you have additional questions, and then I think we need to move on to the next agenda bill. Okay. So no comments? Who wants to start? There are comments okay. if you want. I think the thing that drives me absolutely crazy is that none of that, if I'm a citizen trying to follow this, there's just no transparency in terms of what these parcels might be used for, whether it's a school, whether it's a water tower, and it, it makes the whole thing so difficult. And so I don't know with our rules if you can amend your agenda bill or whatever, but what is missing here is some sort of narrative that would put any context or transparency on this for the public. This doesn't make any sense. So it's not just what might they use it for. That whole story you just told is nowhere. And not that that's what it's gonna be. Maybe it's not a water tower, but there, it's just this is completely hidden from the public. And their opportunity to join in on any of the conversation They'll come to the public hearing and they'll see what we saw tonight. And unless they watch the tape and hear you say what you said and hear the school district's presentation, this is just hidden. It's just totally hidden. So I don't know how you fix that, um, but that's just the way it comes across. It's not very transparent. Yeah. Well, um, I would agree with those comments. And uh, um, at this point, I don't understand at all why we don't leave everything CF, have everything be CFO, except the IC, um, because there's a, um, there does seem to be a real time sensitivity on that one, and um, that uh, we've at least talked about before. Um, but my comments about CFO at this point have nothing to do with the merits of um, the site as a potential school site. There's just, I just don't have enough information to even know whether um, 
whether that would be an appropriate site. And so I don't want my comments to be misconstrued um, by our um, good friends at the school district as me not supporting that for a school. I just, it's, I just don't think it's appropriate this time to do CFF, um, at least I don't, that's my comment tonight. And same thing with the wash dot. You know, I think the answer wash dot wants it is just completely falls short for reasoning for me. And the fact that we're already working on something that we know nothing about, but oh, but just do CFF because they might be thinking about something. It's just, um, yeah, that's really concerning to me. We keep hearing that we make decisions before it's out in the public, and this is a perfect example of why some people feel that way. Seems like I've heard talk about a water tower for a couple of years. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, there, I mean that's, they that's been out there for a long time. But and but I was never clear about the location. I remember fearing that it would interfere kind of the open space that's that's already used by the public uh, uh, on the um, west side of Highlands Drive, where there is the footpath that might go into that area. But I think I asked that once and it was dispelled. No, it wouldn't go there. Is, is that, that, is that, is this the water tower? Is that the yes. same water tower? Yes. Okay, so it's kind of in that. It that has to be at that elevation. Yeah, understood, understood. And of course the packet it does have the information from the letter from the school district and the location that um, they even kind of drew a seven acre box around the location. So. And that that we we knew that the concept of a school was that's there, and I think the uh, the whole TOD project as well um, said did, did specify this location uh, for for that maintenance yard for or whatever it's called for CenturyLink. So those those uses are are out there, not a lot of detail yet, but uh, sufficient to know what the potential land uses are. Uh, the, uh, so I'm glad to know to learn more now about the other potential use, the water tower. It'd be, it would be good uh, to add that in there. So the so coming into this meeting, I thought the same thing that this is this is a pre. We're going to have a pre. We have to set the annexation prior to the hearing, and the administration has made a proposal. That's the way I look at this. That's IC, and then the CFO and CFF. And and I, I came here. Wondering why CFF was anywhere other than what the school district had identified as a location that maybe they could use. So the so I see as proposed makes sense. The CFO makes a sense where it is. Uh, the the but the CFF beyond what um, uh, beyond what the school district identified as what they're interested in didn't make any sense. And and. Um, now we hear that maybe there's a, it might be in one of those areas that a water tower, but that's not what was said earlier. You said what the wash dot might want. Is there something else being referred to then? Something separate than a water tower that we need, not what wash dot wants? I do not know yeah. of anything other than the conversation between PWE and wash dot about a reservoir. So I don't know why the other parcels, I think, I think there's, there's like actually an existing bench on one of those that's the right spot for the reservoir. It, it, it will be screened from the freeway. It's perfect. So I don't know why the rest of it's CFF. And I don't know if WashDOT, if that was their ask to make it CFF. That's what Sheldon, I'm just no, going with what Sheldon told me. I didn't know we'll, the We need the to tighten that down, clearly. Um, <laughs> you know, but part of that is, is um, a necessity of our water utility expansion. So that would be, so I think one of the things that I think we need to provide you all before the hearing is probably a land plan for all the property with the stuff that we know that's coming, even if it's conceptual, mm -hmm. to show it what it's gonna look like. Um, because what's, then you- What's potential, what's, what's been discussed. Potential. You said exactly. what's coming. We Sorry, potential. Mm -hmm. um, and that way you can see what at least we believe is going to be the outcome of that, assuming you make the zoning consistent with what the administration is recommending. So that part, um, you know, when Trish summarized, I also heard an expectation of understanding grading impacts. If the school 
were to move forward, and that's another piece we can so we can provide some of that technical information because then you guys can understand, make a better decision on, on what to do with the property. Okay. So the only, th the only thing that I would recommend or would want to see different is, is keeping the potential school area at a pre-annexation level of, of CFF. I, would, I mean, I see everything uh, CFO and then just that seven acres. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry for the confusion. Okay, next. Um, I guess this one may be simpler. Because <laughs> uh, we're all tired. <laughs> no, because it's, cause, yeah, because it is. Agenda Bill 7442. Thank you, Gail, Steve, and Ron for coming. And, and, you know, before that last picture that you had up there, yeah, you didn't even let you me You said through. it, thank you, that showed the uh, potential CFF where the school district indicated their interest. Mm -hmm. That drawing isn't even that up in the upper right. That's in the upper right. Oh, this? Uh, it's not right there. Close. That's not even close to the seven acres at the school district. Right. That's and twice as big. And this was drawn in saying, June so, before we even my, knew. Sorry, so. My, I, Right. So my, my message is that that information can face something that's not even close to what we're discussing. So that's right. that. And so that's yes. what's out there. Yes. Right. So it's pretty easy to look at that and go, oh, my gosh. Right. This is this is this is quite different. Right. So. It's evolved a lot since beginning of June. But also, too, we tried to do the. Um, once we heard from them and what their idea was, we tried to figure out how to draw it on the contours because before the, the map that you saw that are just the stick dash lines was just to get it to boundary review board with. There's an idea that there might be three different zones within the parcel. Okay, we're but moving on. Thank you. Agenda Bill 7442. Trish, here. <laughs> Trish, <Hello>. welcome. <laughs> Shazam. Mm. This is very similar, I Shazam. hope easier than the previous one, because this is a <laughs> very, very small parcel, less than two acres, owned by the city of Bellevue. It is already the site of a reservoir. Um, we took it over in the assumption that you all approved that became effective uh, January 1st of this year. And now that uh, we've assumed it as a utility now we get to bring it into our jurisdiction and it's um, completely surrounded by the city limits um, this is it this teeny tiny little gray parcel um, and it already has a, a reservoir on it yes so there's view. no potential and, development and of it's it. surrounded by trees which is a i couldn't even get an aerial picture of it because it just is, is so beautifully surrounded by trees. No. What is the landowner? <laughs> what does the landowner want? Uh, the Did you bring city w of utility people with you so we could talk knows about it? that we're taking it over. So um, this also gets the two public hearings. It gets all the same thing, but not the intrigue that the previous uh, annexation had. Intrigue. Are there questions about the tiny little utility site? Not even two acres? So is this the same thing only if we have any questions or comments? Yes. Because, okay, so <laughs> I have none. No questions, Paul? No questions? Nice map. <laughs> okay, then. So, um, that's it? I guess I need to. Uh, public comment. Public comment Bell on Bellevue. It. No? Oh, that's interesting. No. Okay. Show how jaded I am. Because we need evidence of that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking, it's late. I'm still here, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, you I are. am. So, in our Issaquah CFF zone, are we going to keep the trees or are we going to cut the trees down from around the reservoir so that we can see it? Oh, okay. Pretty jaded. That's pretty jaded. But you know, it's I I I think we we probably could because I I walk around a reservoir all the time and they've carefully cut all the trees out from around the reservoir that I walk around all the time. So I would ask that question in all seriousness. So can we get that answer? Answered? Uh, that's no. a question. Well, yeah, that's a question. PWO, I can ask okay. what their practice is for tree 
maintenance around Access. utilities. Okay. That's okay, if there's nothing else, then we are adjourned. Interesting. Interesting.